Hey everyone, Jessica from Coder Coder here. Thanks so much to Free Code Camp for having me on their channel. In this video, we're going to build a landing page template from frontendmentor.io. If you get stuck at any time during this tutorial, you can check out the completed source code on my GitHub link down below. And if you like this video and want more, I'm actually creating a course called Responsive Design for Beginners. You can sign up to get updates on my progress creating the course, as well as be the first to find out when it launches. And without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so the website we're going to be building today is from frontendmentor.io. They have tons of different challenges of website templates you can build yourself. And the one we're building today is called EasyBank Landing Page. Now, what I'm going to do is download these starter free files. And with that, you just get JPEGs of the design, which you can definitely work off of. But if you want the full sketch file, you have to pay $8.99. So either way works. We're going to be working with the free files right now. So let's set up our project. On the left, I have my empty project folder. And then on the right, we have the files that we downloaded from Frontend Mentor. In this folder, we have an index.html file, which we do want to carry over here to our project. There's also an images folder, and these contain the SVGs and PNGs and JPEGs that we need to use for this website. So we're going to copy the images folder over as well. And there's also a style guide file, which I think would be pretty handy. And then lastly, the design folder contains the JPEGs of the different designs. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I've made an Adobe XD file and in that I've basically copied and pasted all the JPEGs so that I have all the designs in one place. It just makes things a little bit easier. So now that we have our files in our project, let's open up VS code. Okay. So here in VS code, I have the project folder open. You can see that we have the index.html file from Frontend Mentor, and we also have the style guide file, which is helpful to tell you, you know, what widths the design's at, as well as some colors and um, font information. So we'll definitely be using those. And we have the images folder here with all the images. Okay, so when I'm working with website projects, usually I'm going to be using SAS, SCSS syntax, and we're going to have to also have some JavaScript. So let's create those files now. So in the project root, I'm going to create a folder called app. And in that folder, I'm going to create two subfolders, one for JS for the JavaScript file, and then one for SCSS for our SAS files. So in the SAS file folder, um, in the SAS folder rather, let's create our main SAS file, style.scss. And this is going to be the main SAS file that we're going to import all of our partial SAS files into. And we're going to create one called globals. SCSS. Yeah, that's right. I also usually create one called variables because I like using SAS variables a lot. So let's import those into our main SAS file. Import variables because we want our variables to come first so the other SAS files can use them. Then import globals. Okay. So let's start adding some boilerplate styles here. So the globals, the first one I usually do is in the HTML selector, I'm going to say font size is 100%. This is more accessible, lets the user control the zoom level in their browser. We're also going to do box sizing, border box. And what this property does is it makes the size of elements sort of include padding in the final width. So it's just a bit easier when you're working with elements like that. Then we also want to inherit that box sizing border box to all elements. So using the wildcard selector here, as well as the before pseudo element and the after pseudo element selector. And they're going to inherit the box sizing border box from the HTML element. Now for the body element, let's add some sort of resets here. So we'll say margin zero, padding zero. I also like to do a line height of 1.3, just to add some spacing between lines. And we're going to add our fonts in as well. If you look in the style guide, it said that the font that we're using is Public Sans. I'm going to go to our browser here, copy this in. I think it wanted to use 300 light and then 400 regular. So we'll select both of those and we're going to embed it. We'll just copy this link tag here and put it in our index.html over here above the title. Now, since we're in the index.html file, let's also add a link tag for our CSS file. 
I'm going to create a dist folder and I want to put all my final CSS files in there. So I'm going to say dist style.css. Uh, and then we also, I think, want to add a script um, to load our JavaScript file. That one's just going to be in the app folder. So app.js, script.js. So let's go into our folder here and create that. Script.js, then we'll just add some test code so we can test it. Hello world, why not? Now that we have some SAS files, you know, just basic styles added, let's also test out our SAS workflow. To compile my SAS to CSS, I like to use this extension called Live SAS Compiler. So if you don't have this installed yet, you can just type in Live SAS Compiler in the extensions marketplace and click this button to install it. You might need to restart VS Code if you're installing it for the first time now. But once you have that set up, when you open a project file, you should see some buttons in the bottom. One says watch SAS and the other one says go live. So if we click that watch SAS button, we're going to watch our SAS files. And then if you want to go live, we click the go live button and it should load the local website in our browser. And you can see that that is indeed the case. Obviously this doesn't look too fancy since you know we just added the text from the design here. But we can also check down in the console window here and our hello world message is loading. So it looks like everything's working correctly. See, we need to add that font to our code. So in our globals, we're gonna say font family and let's do that before line height. Font family. I believe it was called Public Sans. So we're just going to copy this over. There we go. Okay, so let's check our browser again. And we don't need this anymore. So it looks like we have the font Public Sans successfully imported. So now, going back to our VS Code, what we want to do is we want to basically start creating the markup for our website. So let's go into our index.html file. And we're going to start writing markup over here. I'm just going to actually comment out all the copy from the design, just so we don't have this extra stuff, you know, visible on the website. We're going to start writing our markup. So let's go back to our design. And what I'm going to do is try to do the mobile first approach. And we're going to make our default styles without media queries, the mobile styles, and we're going to build the mobile website first. And what I usually do is I'll go from the top down. So let's start with the header. So taking a look at the header, it has a logo on the left and it has a hamburger button on the right, which then when you open it, opens this mobile menu. Then if we compare that to what we have for the desktop design, it also has a logo on the left that has some links, looks like in the middle, and then there's a CTA button on the right side. So let's create the markup and styles for this header in our body tag. We're going to create a header. And then in that header, we want to add our logo image. And we're also going to assume that this is going to link to the homepage. So we'll just make that open that. And then in this anchor tag, we want to add our image for the logo. So image source images. And then we want to look for this logo SVG. Then alt, oops, alt, we'll call that easy bank since that's the name of the site we're making. Let's see if that loaded on our site. Okay, so that was easy, right? <laughs> I think actually what I want to do in addition to that is create a nav and I'm going to put everything in that navigation in this nav tag. What we got is the logo and then we have our hamburger menu on the right. So that's probably also going to be an anchor link. It's just going to go to the same page. And we want to create um, a hamburger menu. And the hamburger menu is those three lines. So let's create three spans. So we're gonna use an Emmet shortcut span times three. So three empty spans. And we also probably need a class for this. And we're just gonna call this hamburger for the hamburger menu. And in the same way, maybe we can create a class up here for the logo. So we'll say class equals logo. If we look back at the design, we can see that everything is in one line. So that tells me that this nav element should probably be a flexbox parent to put everything on the same line. Now, one other thing I like to do is I like to use a lot of helper classes 
So instead of having to write display flex on every single element in this web page that is a Flexbox parent, we're going to create a helper class called flex. And I'm going to add that in our globals. Add it there. So flexbox styles. We'll say flex class. And we're going to say display flex. And let's add a few other flex related classes. So flex, um, one property we use a lot is justify content. So let's say jc dash space between. And that will be justify content space between because that is used quite often. You can also maybe create one for center. And I'm just going to basically be creating these as, you know, as we need them. So let's also create some um, align content properties. So align content, and usually it's align content center. So we'll write that align content, or I'm sorry, align items rather, center. So it's a I center. Okay, so this is fine for now. We're probably going to use more later. But now what we've done is in my SAS, I've created a flex class for display flex and then these other ones for the flex properties. So what I can do now is, uh, let's see, split this up. So you can see our HTML on the left and our styles on the right. What I'm going to do is in the nav, in, in addition to the flex class, we also want a flex justify content space between. So let's just check out how it looks in the browser. Okay, so you can see our logo here. Let's see what's going on. So we can see the nav here. So we have a logo and then we have the hamburger class, but it looks like that has a zero width and box model. So yeah, it looks like it has a no width, but there is a height. So what we probably need to do is make those spans. Spans by nature are, are display inline. So that means they're not going to take up any space if there's like no content in them. So what we want to do is we want to add some styles now for our header. So we're going to go back to our SAS folder, create a new SAS file. We're going to call this header.scss. And then we want to make sure that we are importing that into our main SAS file. So just trying to keep things organized here. Header. So now in our header, what we want to do is I think I'm going to add another class for the header. Let's say class header. And this is so I can use BEM block element modifier for writing my SAS classes. So first we have this main element header. And then in here, we're going to say maybe header underscore underscore logo. And then header underscore underscore menu, maybe hamburger menu. Okay, so now in our SAS files, we can start using the ampersand for header. Then there's a logo. And then another one for the menu. This is the mobile menu. So we'll just add a little comment here saying that mobile menu. And we also have an image tag here. So I'm not sure if we're going to need this, but we'll just add it here anyway. So in the menu, we have some span elements. I'm just going to use the direct child selector here to make sure keep things as specific as possible. And we're going to say display block for these spans. Now, if we go back to the design, the hamburger menu is looks like a bunch of dark black or very dark gray lines. So we're going to start with some general styles here. First thing was first, actually, we probably want to get our colors added in from the style guide. So you can see here, these are all the different colors. They're using HSL instead of hex, but that's totally fine. So let's start adding variables for our colors so we can reuse them. So dark blue. So now we're probably going to use this dark blue color for the hamburger menu, and we'll just kind of see how that looks. So let's close our script file here. We don't really need that right now. So going back to our header SAS file. We want those lines to be that dark blue color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say width and the width of those hamburger lines are now, since this is a JPEG, this is kind of the only way that we can really see how big things are. I'm creating a little rectangle here. That's semi-transparent so you can still see through it, but you can still move it around and you can kind of use it to see how big things are pretty small. 
looks like it's about say 26 and then about 12 or 13 height. Okay. So what I want to do is here, I'm going to set this to, I think it was 26 pixels. And then the height of each, this is just for each line. So let's say two pixels. Oh yeah. And then the background color, background color, and we'll use the dark blue variable. All right. Let's see how that looks in their website now. Okay. So <laughs> it's a little small up here, but we do have our hamburger lines here, but we need to add some spaces between the lines. So what I'm going to do is I want to add a margin bottom to all the spans except the last one. So what we can do is we can use the not selector. So not last child. And then if it's not the last child, we'll say margin bottom. And let's just kind of guess here, maybe three pixels. So going back to our website, we can see now that we do have the three lines and our logo. Now, of course, everything's up right on the edge here. So we need to add some padding here. So let's see how much padding there is. Let's get the top and bottom padding first. And I'm going to kind of assume that the top and bottom padding are the same. If we get a little rectangle here, about 22 inches or pixels rather. And if we move it down, it might be a little bit more. So maybe 24. So 24 pixels of padding on top and bottom. And then for left and right, about the same. Let's just say 24 all around. So going back into our code, what we can do is we want to add padding to the nav itself. So in the header, uh, we're going to add another selector here for the nav. Just no class, at least for now. So we'll say padding uh, 24 pixels all around. Okay, so let's see how that looks. All right. Oh, why is that so tall? Let's see what's going on here. So we have a nav here. That's 24 pixels all around. It looks like we need to center things vertically. So what I didn't do was I need to add another flex property here. So flex, just to show you what I got here, flex AI dash C. That's going to align items to center. All right. So that looks a bit more centered. There we go. Okay. So we got our nav, we got our spacing. One thing we do want to do is see what the differences are between the mobile and then the desktop nav. Mobile obviously has the hamburger uh, menu, does not have these links or the CTA. So these are desktop only, but I should be able to use these same markup for both mobile and desktop. So let's add some elements in for the links as well as the CTA. Okay. So let's scoot this over here a bit. So logos first for both. And then for the mobile, the menu is over here. Now, since the, the hamburger is not going to be visible on desktop, I'm just going to add these other elements down here. So the first one we want to do is since I'm using Flexbox to separate them out. Let's create a new element. We'll just say div and we'll say header underscore underscore links. And in here we'll say anchor um, link. So I think there were how many links? Five link times five. There we go. And I think the text is down here. So we can just kind of move those up into here, into the links. So header links, and you know, this is just a landing page we're doing. So we're just going to make all the links, the pound sign or the hashtag. So going back to our header SAS file, we're probably going to have to add some styles for that. So under the menu, We'll say header underscore underscore links. And then in that is going to be some anchor links. Let's go back to our website. And now we can see that we have our links. Okay. First things we want to get rid of that underline. And I want that to be true for all links on the page. So we're going to add some styles here for just default styles. So links, a visited, a hover. Um, text decoration, none. Okay, good. Now let's style those links. Let's see what we got here. Check our notes in the style guide. Okay. It says font size is 18 pixels. I guess we could add that font size to the body tag. So 18 pixels, and it's actually better to use relative units like rems instead of pixels. So to get from pixels to rems, you can divide 18 by 16. So if we check this inspect element, 
see. Yep, font size is 1.125 rems. And if you click on the computer tab, it'll tell you it's 18 pixels, which is what we want. Okay, color seems to be, this actually seems smaller. So this might be like maybe 16 or even 14. Let's find out. It's about 14. So we're going to adjust the font size in the um, header. Font size, I think we said 14. So 14 pixels divided by 16 is 0.875. Um, another thing you can actually do, and let's do that now, is we're going to create some variables for these font sizes, just in case we need to reuse them. So we'll say body, or maybe font um, medium, the 18 pixels or font size 1.125 rems. And then we'll replace this with the variable name. And the other one was font small. And this is going to be 14 pixels. There we go. Take that over here. Then we'll replace that with the font small variable. Kind of helps just to add some comments so you can remember what this is. 18 pixels. We'll add more variables as we need, but for now, Let's also check out the colors, probably that lighter gray for the text here. So I think I can actually, I might just add it to the body selector since it seems like most of the body text is that gray color. So let's add that in the global one as well. This just makes it so that you don't have to add, you know, font size and color for every different element. You can just add it globally first to the body for whatever, you know, the most often used one is. And then you can make them different for the elements that need that. Let's check out this website. Where's the color coming from? It looks almost purple, not gray. There should be another color, hopefully. Uh, it's probably this light grayish blue, so we'll just replace that. There we go. I wonder if this is from the link color. Change to red. Yeah, it's not taking for some reason. I think it's probably taking the default color from the browser, so... What I want to do is we'll just add that color property there. Okay, that's a little bit too, that's a little bit too light. So we're just going to go back to the grayish blue and same for here. There we go. Okay, that looks more like it. So now we have the links added. We want to add that CTA button that's just for desktop. So let's move this over here because we're going to need that pretty soon. This is going to be probably a button element. So we'll say button type equals button. And then what does it say? Request invite. Okay, so now it's a button. Now, of course, we need to style these button styles. So we're going to add the button styles again in our globals. So first thing we want to do is we want to kind of reset the colors and different styles. So this one is a gradient background and it has rounded corners. What we probably want to do is figure out what the size of the button is. So we can do that by, I'm just going to add padding to the sides. So it's about 16 padding on top, about the same on the bottom. And then, oops, for the left and right, it's about, let's just say 30. So we'll say 16 padding on top and bottom, and then 30 on left and right. So we're going to use the button element as well as the button class just in case because sometimes we might want to have an anchor link that has the button class as well. Padding 16 on top, so that's one rem, and then 30, which would be 30 divided by 16, 1.875 rems. Okay, and then also rounded corners, so border, radius, um, I'm not sure. We'll just say 50 pixels for now. Okay, let's see how that looks. Okay, getting there. We also probably want to make it use the cursor when you hover over it. There we go. So now it looks like it's a link. Looking back at the design, this is a gradient. It looks like it's a linear gradient just going from left to right. So going from this green color to this kind of teal blue green color. Let's see which colors we're going to be using. It's probably lime green going to bright cyan. So. Let's add it. I like adding the background here. Background, linear gradient, and it's going to go lime green to bright cyan. 
Okay, so it's horizontally. So I want to make it go kind of vertical. So I think it is to right. I'm not positive that's the correct syntax, and it looks like it's not. CSS linear gradient. This is what I do quite a bit when I'm building websites. So we can go to, let's, let's check out MDN. Okay, two left comma, so I need to add a comma there. And let's go back to our website. Oh, still didn't work. What's going on here? Maybe I'm not using the right property. Background linear gradient to left. Let's kind of inspect this in the thing itself. Linear gradient, that's right. To dash right. No, there's no dash, that's why. Let's just test this and make sure. I think I need to edit it in the code itself. There we go. Oh yeah. I think we need to get rid of that border. So in buttons, we're going to say border zero. Okay, so now that's gone, which is good. And then we want the color to be white. Nice. And let's see how that matches. Looks like it might be bold actually. Font weight, we'll say 700 for bold. Although it said it was, let's check our notes again. Weights 300 and 400. Go back to the design here. So I'm guessing the default weight is the 300 for light and then the normal is sort of the headline stuff. So let's kind of go back into our body. Font weight, we want the default weight to be 300. And then for the link, we'll say the weight is 400 since it is a little bit heavier. Is that taking? <laughs> um, font weight 300, which is good. Check this out. Font weight is 400. It doesn't look any different. Weird. Okay, I think this might be because it is a button element. Um, if we do font weight 300, font weight 400, it doesn't seem to change at all. Changes to an anchor link. Yeah, it is changing a bit. So this might just be a bug for the button element. Maybe we'll just change that button to an actual anchor link. Because it could be an anchor link in real life. It really just depends on what you want to do. Add a class, and we'll say class of button. Now we know that this should inherit all these styles here. So let's check this again. Okay, so looks like the weight is correct. Pretty big, I think, in the design it looks like it was the same size. So let's go back to header. This is maybe header underscore underscore CTA. So font size, we'll just make this also font small. And color, we'll make this white. Uh, why is this gray? <laughs> oh my gosh, nothing's working. What? Color red? Important. Oh, maybe it's because it's the anchor link. Oh, okay. Probably because... Oh yeah, I did this color grayish blue. I might actually just get rid of this thing here. And instead, add it to the anchor links. Because it's a bit more specific, because I don't want every single link to necessarily be that grayish blue color. There we go. So that looks pretty good. All the links are there. So the next thing we want to do is we want to either hide or show the different navigation elements depending on if they're needed on the mobile design and then the desktop design. So how we're going to control that is another set of helper classes. And this is going to be a little bit more complicated because first I need to create the classes. We'll just call this visibility. So hide for mobile. I'm including tablet with this mobile class. So in this what we want to do is hide for tablet and mobile devices. And we'll create another one, hide for desktop. Hide for desktop widths, um, viewport widths. So the way we're going to target this is we need to create a media query. But what I'm going to do is create a mixin so we can make things a bit more reusable. Let's create a new SAS file called mixins. And this one's going to be related to breakpoints. The final code that we want to have is something like media, and then the target will be min width, 1024 pixels for desktop. 1024 divided by 16, 64. 
And for uh, media queries, you want to use EMs. They've just been shown to be the most consistent among browsers. And then we have our styles go here. This is what we want to output, but we want to save these breakpoints so we don't have to keep typing them every time, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a SAS map. We're going to call this breakpoints up. And then we're going to basically create a bunch of different values for breakpoints up, meaning at this point and bigger, use these styles. So to do that, we're going to first create one for medium because we're assuming the small size is the default one. 640 pixels divided by 16 is 40 EMs, 40 EMs. I'll create another one for large. And let's say that one's going to be 1024 pixels divide by 16 is 64 and we'll create another one for extra large since we have a lot of large screens these days 1400 divided by 16 so 87.5 ems so now this is our sas map for breakpoints up but i'm also going to create one for breakpoints down the first one breakpoints up is if you want to target this viewport and up and that's what I use for most of my styles, but there are some cases where you want to target a style from a certain viewport and on down. So for that, we're going to not use the X large because X large on down is basically everything, but we are going to add a small here for mobile devices. For mobile, we're going to take this value here because medium would be 40 EMs and on and on up. For small, we're going to say 40 EMs and down. And we'll move this up here medium on down so this is anything smaller than 1024 and then 87.5 ems oops need to leave that there we don't want to overlap these so i'm just going to make these one pixel smaller the breakpoints we're using are 640 pixels 1024 pixels and i think i said 1400 pixels that's for the breakpoints up so for these we want it to be 640 and up so 639 and down this is so we don't have any overlapping styles. I try to not mix breakpoints up and breakpoints down in the same style rule. It's either one or the other, usually going to be breakpoints up. We need to recalculate these numbers here. This is going to be 639 divided by 16, 39.9375.9375. And then 1023 divided by 16, 63.9375. And the last one's going to be 1399. 87.4375. There we go. Now that we have our two maps, what we can do now is create our mixin. So we're going to say mixin breakpoint up. It's going to take a parameter. We'll just call it size. We're going to write what we want the, the mixin to output. So we want it to output a media query. So media. And then min width. And this is where we're going to put in this size variable. I'm sorry, this is not right. So the min width is going to be the, the, the value for that size that we've determined. So to get that, we need to use map dash get. So you can see this code has some helper text here. It turns value into map associated with the given key. So map get. And the map we're using is going to be for the first one, break points up. We also want to grab that size parameter. So the size is going to be either small, medium, large, X large, and it'll return this EMS number. When we're using this mixin, we want to write this media query. And then in the media query, we're going to just output whatever content is in the style. And I'll show you how that works in a second. We got our mixin written for breakpoint up and let's create another one for breakpoint down. And uh, everything's going to be pretty much the same except reasonably down. And then also instead of min width is going to be max width and then the content. So going into our global styles again, the hide for mobile class, we want to hide for medium and down. So we're going to call the mixin by using include, and we want to do breakpoint down. And the size we're going to call is going to be the medium because for medium and down, we want to say display none. And then in a similar way for the desktop, we want to call a mixin, but the one mixin we're going to use is going to be breakpoint up because we want to hide the element using this class for desktop and up. So that would be large and extra large. 
display none. Okay, now let's see if this works by adding these classes to the different elements in the header. So for mobile, we want to hide those links as well as that CTA. So let's add the class here. And then for desktop, we want to hide the hamburger menu since we don't need that for desktop. And we're going to keep the logo because that's going to be used for both. Okay, so now moment of truth. Let's see how this works. Looks like something's not really working, but let's see. Yeah, this is when we debug our code. So hide from mobile for desktop. Interesting. Looks like there's no errors. So what we want to do is maybe check out the final CSS file. There we go. Let's see if we can find that class. Oh, looks like we didn't even didn't even get pulled in for some reason. That's weird. Oh wait, there's a error here. No mix in named breakpoint down. Okay, let's go back and start from the beginning. Oh, we didn't add the mixins SAS file. So let's let's do that. That seems pretty important. Now we go. Okay, now there's a success message. Go back to our site. Oh my gosh, what's going on here? Okay, so it does look like things are hiding and showing. So let's see when when does this switch? For 1024 and up, it's showing the links and the button, and then yeah, so hide for desktop display none or the the hamburger menu. And then here, there's no styles here, but as soon as we get shorter, we use the hide from mobile. So at 1024 is when everything either gets hidden or shown. So this looks like it is working. Let's look at the design again and just make sure we have all the styles correctly. We need some more space between these links here. So let's see how much space we need to add. It's about maybe 32 pixels. So going into our header SAS file, header links, A. What we're going to do is we're going to add a margin to the right of the link, but we don't want to add a right margin to the last link because there's nothing after that. So we're going to use a not selector and then not last child. So as long as it's not the last child, margin right is going to be, what do we say? 32 pixels. All right, so now let's make sure there's no margin added to that last link. Contact blog. Oh, why is there white space here? And then careers does not have it. So the white space is probably added because of the enter key. Um, there we go. Okay, now there's no white space. That's weird. Let's go back here, check one more time. Let's check this button styles again. 152 by 50 seems a little bit big to me. I feel like some of the padding may, might not be quite accurate. Here is our div. 163 by 44. And let's kind of guess what this font size is. It's probably 14, which I think it should be correct. Let's double check the font first and then we'll adjust the padding to match. So if we go to computed and see that the font size is 14. So that's right. So we're just going to adjust the padding here. The padding right now is 16 on the top and bottom. It's 50 pixels tall right now, and it should be 46. So we would need to um, subtract four pixels, so two pixels from the top and bottom. So let's go back to our button styles. And here's the padding. So one rem, which is 16 pixels, but we want to subtract that and make it 14. Um, 14 divided by 16, 0 0.875. Rem. <laughs> there you go. So now it's 46, which is pretty good. And then it should be 163, and it's only 152, so it's about 10. So we'll add five more to each to the left and the right. Right now it is 30. So we want it to be 35 on each. So 35 divided by 16 is 2.1875. 2.1875. Okay, so that looks a bit more like the design. 162 by 46, which looks much closer. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And let's actually double check this logo size as well for both mobile and desktop. It looks like they're the same size for both, but let's just make sure. So it's about 141 by 22. If it's the same for mobile. Yeah, it's the same. Let's see what the actual logo is here. 139 by 20. 
and it should be 141 by 22. So let's see where this gets set. I think it's in the header. Oh, we didn't even set the size. Okay, so it needs to be 141 by 22. So 141 divided by 16, 8.8125. And then height should be 22, 1.375. Okay, let's see if that helps at all. Alrighty. So 141 by 22, 141 by 22. All right, this is pretty good. So we got our mobile styles here for the hamburger menu. As we get bigger, we got the desktop styles. So let's check out the active states for desktop. We go over here. Looks like the text gets darker and, uh oh, we have this border here. And then for the button, it looks like it gets sort of like whited out a little bit. Yeah, it looks like that. So first let's tackle the that bottom border and the color for the text. So, so header links, what I'm gonna do is for the hover, pseudo selector we want the color to be the darker gray so it was grayish blue here so it's probably gonna be this dark blue color here let's double check on that nice and to make it a little bit nicer we can add a transition so transition for the color and the timing for that let's just say maybe 200 milliseconds and then i like to do ease in out for most transitions there you go. So you can see it's a little, you know, just a little bit nicer. Let's figure out how to do that bottom gradient. So the problem is here right now, these elements are just the width or the height of the text itself. So what I will need to do is I need to add some either margin or padding for the top and or bottom to make it the height of the, probably the entire thing because we're centering everything, remember? So where's my little rectangle? Where'd it go? I think I left it over here. Oh, there's another one down there. Take this one. We'll take this one in case we need it later. Make it bigger so we can see it. So let's take that over here and then see how tall this thing needs to be. Looks like the header itself is about probably 80 pixels tall is what we would guess. And then the little border thing is about five pixels tall. Let's go back to our site, add some border so we can see what we're doing here. I can see that this has a border. This is actually a little bit tall as well. And it really should be 80 pixels tall. It's probably the padding. So the header has no padding, the nav has padding here. 24 pixels of padding, so let's try. And we should probably convert that to rems as well. So if the total height's gonna be 80, let me take this down. So 17 pixels and 24 pixels for header nav padding. And then if we want to convert that to REMS, 1.0625. And then 24, 1.5. Okay, so now it is 80 pixels tall, which is pretty much about what we wanted. Let's see if we can do it with a pseudo element. I'm not sure if this is gonna work. But let's just say for this one, um, header links A, and the new set of styles here. Header links A, B4. So content needs to be an empty string. So let's try position absolute, width of 100%, display block. Then we'll make it a height of five pixels, and then background of, let's just say, you know, the lime green color. So the pseudo element's going all the way across, which we don't want it to do. I thought this position relative would work. Let's try adding it here. Okay, there we go. Maybe we'll try to align it to the zero. Left of zero, right of zero. So instead of width, we're just saying left and right. So now each link has a little line, which is what we want, but it doesn't seem like it's in the right place. And I think it's because we want to adjust it so that it's right up to the header. So now we want this green line to be down where the blue line is. So let's see if we can do that. 
We might actually just need to add a static. Let me think about this. What we could do is say bottom zero negative statically set it to 30. That might actually be the easiest one. So let's do that. Okay. So before we forget, let's copy these styles. So header links a I'm going to say position relative and then header links a let's add this here. So before I'm going to be content empty. And then let's just kind of copy those other styles that we'd added here. Okay. So now if this actually worked, oops, what did I do? What did I do? Looks like set position relative. Hmm. What did I do? Oh, I didn't add position absolute. There we go. There we go. I think what was happening before was position relative. I think it just made them stack for some reason. It makes every element a display block, which takes up 100% width. And then it's in the flow of the document. Interesting. Okay. Anyway, so here we got our lines. Now what we want to do is make the colors correct, first of all. And then we're going to only show the line when you're hovering. So if we look over here, it looks like, looks like it has the same green actually as the button. It goes from lime green to blue. So let's go back to our button styles. So here's the linear gradient. I wonder if we're reusing this gradient again in this website. So it's using the buttons, which is already taken care of. This I'm assuming are just icons. So this is just green. So I think we'll be okay just leaving the styles like this, and then we can just copy it. If, if, if it was used multiple times, I might create like a helper class for that, but let's just leave it like this for now. So. And then we also only want that to appear on hover. So when you hover on the element itself, the pseudo element will get this background. That's cool. Now we need to figure out a way to make this more transitioned because it's a little bit, you know, kind of jarring, it just like suddenly pops up as opposed to the color of the text link itself. What we can do is unfortunately you cannot make the background itself. You can't make the background itself transition. It just doesn't work that way. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the background back in the pseudo element by default, but we're going to make opacity zero. And then when it's hovered, we'll change the opacity to one. And then we can add the transition here. Opacity 300 milliseconds ease in. It'll be the same. Oh wait, 200 milliseconds. Okay. So now let's get rid of that border too. <laughs> Don't need that. Let's see what this looks like. Now you can see it is fading in and out pretty nicely. Might make it a little bit slower. Let's make them 300 for both. Okay. So now it's a pretty nice little transition here. Okay. So I think these text links are good. Let's move on to the hover state for that button. Let's look at the design one more time. It looks like it just kind of fades to white. So I wonder if we can just make this adjust the opacity. Let's see what this looks like. Opacity. Let's try 0 0.75. See what that switches look. That's pretty good. Okay. So button header CTA in the header. Let's find the CTA. And then we're going to add a transition for the opacity again, and we'll do the same thing. 300 milliseconds. Oops. Ease in out. Now on hover, um, we'll say opacity is zero. Okay. So let's see how that looks now. Whoa. Oh, doesn't want to be zero, 0 0.75. I think I said <laughs> that wouldn't be very good user experience. Looks pretty good.
For making this hamburger menu, the first thing is we need to turn this hamburger into an X when you click on it. So some kind of cool animation. Second thing that happens is this overlay will in some way, shape or form appear over the rest of the website. And then on top of the overlay will be the actual mobile menu. Then clicking on the X will animate it back into the hamburger. The overlay will disappear and the mobile menu itself will also disappear in some way. So the first thing I'm going to do is starting with the hamburger menu, animate it from hamburger to X. So to do that, let's do a little bit of research online. So I'm going to go to codepen.io and I will type in hamburger menu and just kind of see what happens, see what we can find here. I do want to mention before we get into this is that even though you can legally copy any code you find on CodePen. I try to do research, see what other people have done in terms of solutions, see what they've built, but then try to build it myself. So this is really just the steps that I take to build something, just to do some research. That's kind of cool. Let me try hamburger animation. That's really the specific thing we're looking for here. I don't want anything too flashy or too fancy. Mm. Yeah, that's a little too much for me. And I just wanted to include this part in the video because I do feel like researching is a very important part of coding. You don't always have to invent everything from scratch. Okay, I actually kind of like this animation. The middle bar disappears, it fades out, and the two, the top and bottom bars form the X. So let's just see what they did here. They've added some transitions onto this and transform origin line two goes to opacity zero. So it fades out. So it looks like line one, I'm assuming is the top one, rotates 45 degrees. So it's angled. The bottom line is going to rotate negative 45 degrees. And I do like how this looks. So I think I'm going to just try to build this animation. One thing that I think I'm going to do, which is a bit different from a design, is I'm going to make this hamburger menu a little bit taller and more square because we can see the X is actually square and it looks taller than the hamburger menu. We'll make that change and then we'll start adding in the animation. So what I did here was basically added three pixels of margin bottom to the first two spans. It's 26 by 14 height right now. I don't know if 26 by 26 is really what I want. We'll just try to eyeball it, honestly. Let's do five pixels. Use the header underscore underscore menu. This is one benefit of using the BEM styling because I know everything has to be in the header SAS file. There we go. Five. And we'll go back here. Okay. That looks pretty good. I think I'm going to add a class on this header menu so that when it's open, that will sort of turn on the animation. Okay. So header menu. Go back here. So header menu. Then I'll add a helper class and we'll just say open. So in the header, let's kind of refer back to our markup as well. So this here is the mobile menu. So those spans in the header underscore underscore menu. If header underscore underscore menu has a class of open as well, then we're going to transform those spans. Span first child. And we'll add another one for last child. And then I think I need to add one for the middle child. There's no middle child selector, but I think we can do nth child. I think it should be two, because I think the number for those starts with one. Okay, so when it has a class of open, we're going to do transform rotate 45 degrees. Then for the last child, we'll do negative 45 degrees. And then the middle child will say opacity zero. And the reason I'm doing opacity instead of like display none is because you can't transition display block to display none. You have to do opacity, which can use a transition. Now let us test this in the browser. So we're going to reload. And of course I didn't add any JavaScript or anything yet. So we're just going to add manually the open class to the menu. That doesn't look too good. I think it has to do with the transform origin. Because right now what is happening is they're kind of just rotating themselves wherever their middle is. Let's add a transition then we can kind of see that a bit more clearly. Transition will say all 300 milliseconds, ease in, out. Okay, let's try this again. 
with add a class of open, take a look at the hamburger menu. Yeah, so you can see each line is kind of rotating on wherever the center is. The middle one's fine because it's just disappearing. So I actually kind of need to look back at that because you can see that you want the transform origin to be on the sort of left side. Let's kind of see what they did here. Okay, transform origin. 1EM, 1EM. I haven't used transform origin really before, so let's Google that. Transform origin. I try to look at Mozilla Developer Network when I can. Okay, transform origin sets the origin for an element's transformations. It's rotating, the origin is the center, and I'm assuming that's default. So let's try top left. Instead of just rotating from the center, it's the corner is kind of where the rotation starts. So that might be what we want for the first line. Let's just try transform origin top Maybe center left, since they're just lines. Let's just add it for all of them. Transform origin center left. Or let's do left center. I don't know which one needs to be first. I'm not sure if it matters. Let's add this open thing again. Getting closer. I think I'm actually going to add the <laughs> JavaScript here. So I don't have to keep manually adding it in. We don't really need the hello world anymore. For clicking on this, I'm actually going to add an ID because I like to use IDs for the JavaScript functionality. So button hamburger. And then take this ID. So in the script.js, we'll say document query selector. And the selector is going to be the hash button hamburger. And then what's the add event listener? And it's going to be a click. Then when you add it, it'll run this function. I always use a little console log to test first. Open hamburger. Const hamburger equals the button hamburger over here. Actually, let's just call it button hamburger. Then we can reuse this constant that we created. When you click the hamburger, it's going to run this console log message. And then I also want to add a class. And we can do this with class list dot add and then the class name we want to add. Click hamburger. So I'm going to use a little if statement here. So if button hamburger class list contains, if it has open, the open class, I want to remove it. Otherwise, I want to add the open class. So that should take care of the functionality we need for now. Let's click on this. Look at that added the open class and click on it again and it removes it. Okay, so this looks good. Obviously this is, this X looks a bit weird. We just need to kind of adjust the transform origin, I think. Let's try zero pixels, zero pixels, just to see what happens. Oh, look at this. Boy, this looks weird. Oh, that looks much better. Three pixels and one pixel. In the header, where was that? Oh, transform origin. There we go. Let's try again. Clicking on the hamburger menu. Nice. Looks like a nice little X. Hey, look at that. Okay, so this is the first functionality of the hamburger menu. The next thing we want to do is we want to load the overlay. Because we don't have any regular content in the website, I'm just going to maybe add some stuff just so you can see the overlay opening over the regular content. We'll just uncomment all of the HTML here. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to load an overlay. So going back to the design, the overlay, it appears under the white navigation bar and then it's just over everything else. So the header is here and then the nav is included in that. So I could do a couple things. I could create an overlay on the same level as a header and then just make sure the header has a higher Z index so it's on top of the overlay. So let's try that actually. So here's the header. I'm just going to add a div class overlay. Okay, so to make the overlay, let's look at the design again. So it starts with this gray color. I'm assuming it's this sort of blue gray color, which we can use. And then it's a linear gradient, which fades as you go down to transparent. First, let's get the color that we need. So it's probably this dark blue here. The overlay, let's just add a background color as a fallback. Then linear gradient. Oh wait, 
background image, linear gradient. And I always forget what the, but let's just try transparent. We'll see. I am a professional web developer, but I do look up a lot of stuff. Okay, so it looks like that's the correct linear gradient thing. So we do need to make this um, cover everything. And I want to do position absolute. And then we'll just set top to zero for now, right zero, bottom zero, left zero. Actually, I think I might need to do a fixed because it's sort of going like this. So you need to basically set the height of it to 100 VH. Um, so the viewport height. I think this should accomplish the same thing. We'll see. Ooh, look at that overlay. Oh yeah, so I don't really want that. I think I can use the shorthand. Those two, two D, three, one, four D. Hmm, that's not what I want. Um, CSS gradient, fallback color. Um, let's try linear gradient. Here we go. Is there a way to use CSS gradients and fallback colors? That's what I did. Background color, yada yada. Background image. Oh, fallback image. I don't know if that's actually because I did that, but then it just had the background color like this. Hmm. What if I did this? Well, I guess that... Hmm. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Weird. I don't know why this is not working. Well, in any case, maybe we'll just get rid of that background color. Weird. I will just delete it. This is kind of what we want. I want to make sure the text goes sort of taller than what we can do, so we'll just do this. Let's just do... There we go. Okay, so you can scroll down. Overlay's fixed, which is pretty good. Obviously now it's covering up the header, so we don't want that. So for here, we need to, I think, declare the position. Set the position, rather. Or I think what we need to do is make the top the height of the nav bar. So this is about 60. We'll just say top is 60 pixels. There we go. And now we have our overlay. We got top to 60. Actually, we should use rems. So we'll do our little dividing game here. 60 divided by 16 is 3.75 rems. Now, um, we also want to control this with a CSS class. So before we, if we add the open class to the hamburger, it'll open. What I could do is try to just use one CSS class to control all the animations. So I think I'm going to add the open class to the header instead of the button hamburger itself. Open. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and then I'm going to add another section here. Hamburger open styles. Move the overlay into the header. And then we'll add our open styles here. And we'll put it in the header itself, of course. I'll just add it at the top. So if, if the header has class open, then I'm going to say um, header menu. We need to add these styles here. So what I'm doing is I'm basically moving that all the open styles into if the header element has the open class, not the header menu. Let's now test these adjusted styles and update our JavaScript so that we are adding the open class in the header element itself. So create a new constant. We'll just call this header and we'll use the same document query selector and we will select the class of header element. So now, instead of checking if the button hamburger has the open class, we're going to change it to checking if the header has the open class. So we'll update these to remove the open class from the header, and then here we'll add the open class to the header. So what this is doing now is when you click the button, you're going to check if the header has the open class, and if it doesn't have it, add it, and if it does have it, remove it. Let's test this out in our site. We hope 
will happen is when we click this, it'll add the open class. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it works. It's always a good feeling when uh, the code does what you want it to do the first time without having to tweak it. Okay, let's go back into our SCSS and I'm also going to start animating the overlay because right now on the side, it's just kind of like there. Let's take a look at here. In the header, we have the overlay and it's position fixed. So I'm going to create a CSS animation, a keyframe animation, and I'm going to attach it to a helper class. Or actually, I'm probably going to attach it to the, if the header has the open class. Then using that CSS keyframe animation, it's going to fade in or fade out the overlay. We might have to tweak a little bit as we go, but that's kind of the general idea. I think what I'm going to do is by default, I want to make the overlay display none. And then we will fade it in, probably using the opacity and transition, and then fade it out when we close the menu. So I'm going to create a new SAS file actually. So in our app SCSS folder, let's create a new file. I'm going to call this animations. So any keyframe animations we're going to load in this animation SAS file. And then of course we want to actually load it, import it in the main SAS file. So animations. There we go. Actually, let's just put it up under the mixins just to keep things kind of organized. So these are like the functional SAS styles. And then starting here is where we have elements in the different component styles. Keyframe animations, you start by typing at uh, keyframes, and then you write a name for what the animation is. So what I want to do is I'm going to create maybe two animations for the overlay. And I'm just going to call them fade in and fade out. So the first one's going to be fade in. And with keyframes, you start with a from, and then you end with a to, and then you put the initial styles in the from bracket, and then the end of styles in the to bracket. And you can also add percentage of progress in here. So if I wanted to, I could say, let's say 50% do something. Let's indent this a little bit or any percent you want. And then it'll use that to time when certain animations take place. This is more if you have like complex animations. What we're doing in is a pretty simple fade in. So I think I might be able to get away with just using from and to. Okay, so in the header SAS file, the overlay has a default display of none. And then in the animations, I'm just gonna add display none just because that's where we're starting. And then I want to end up having a display block and opacity of one. And we're also gonna start with an opacity of zero. Now the tricky thing about this is you can transition opacity from zero to one. It'll have a nice smooth animation from zero to one, but you can't transition display none to display block. That's just not how CSS works. First it's gonna be display none. Then I'm going to say maybe 1%. So right after it starts, it's going to be display block, but going to be an opacity still of zero. And then from 1% to basically 100% the end, it will stay at display block, but then it's going to transition from zero to one. We can try this out by adding this animation in our styles. Maybe I'll just add the overlay styles up here. So if the header is open, then the overlay is going to have animation. And it actually gives you a little help here. So name, duration, timing function. Um, direction, things like that. The name is the name that we added here. So fade dash in. Duration, let's just say 300 milliseconds. That's kind of my default. Timing function, ease in out is what I usually use. Then delay, I don't think I need a delay. Iteration count, you know, how many times you want this to happen. We just want it to happen once. So I think you don't need to add anything there. And then direction, we want forwards. And then fill mode, I don't think I need that. I don't think I need that. So forwards, this is actually important because saying forwards will ensure that once the animation is complete, it will stay at whatever styles that you've put on the two. Otherwise it'll kind of animate and then reset back to whatever you had styled before adding any animation. So we wanna keep this display block opacity one after it's finished. All right, these are the styles we need for the overlay and let's, I guess, test it out. <laughs> Okay, so here we can see the header, and then we can see the overlay now is display none. So let's click on this and see what happens. Okay, looks like hamburger is still working, but the overlay is not 
animating in. Um, so we know that the animation is being added to the overlay, but for some reason the loading isn't actually working and we're not sure why. What happens if I uncheck the display none? Oh, so it did actually fade in. Look at that. But for some reason, it's not sticking. The end state is not staying on the thing. Display none, but it does have the animation. Okay, time to Google again, <laughs> or I guess DuckDuckGo. CSS animation final state, maybe? Okay, maintaining the final state at the end of a CSS3 thing. And then I really like using, looking at CSS tricks as well as MDN. So Stack Overflow, CSS Tricks, and MDN are kind of my, my main three <laughs> sources that I go to. Okay, looks like this person's also opacity changing from opacity 0 to 1. Elements go back to opacity 0. Animation fill mode is forwards. Well, I did use that, I believe. Yeah, forwards. Maybe does the order matter in terms of what properties I put in here? I'm not really sure. I mean, it seems like it's working if I uncheck the display none. So I'm not sure what is happening. Yeah, it just says forwards should make sure it'll hold the last keyframe state. Don't forget to specify 100%. Huh. I wonder if that does anything. I don't know if that's going to work, but uh, let's check on the NDN. I don't know if you need the, both 100% and the 2. This is just from and 2. Yeah, from 75% to... I don't think I need to actually say 100%. I mean, I guess it can't hurt. Let's just try. I'm not even sure if this is, like, good syntax. Okay, let's try again. Nope, not working. So I don't think it's this. I'm going to delete the 100% stuff. I know this is bad, but I'm going to add an important <laughs> to this. See if that does anything. Nope. Jeez, this is kind of annoying. Fade in, 300 milliseconds, ease in, out, forwards. Hmm. It seems like I'm doing everything right, but obviously it's not working. Let's just get rid of this important because that didn't help. I'm going to try commenting out the display none just for now. And I'm going to try just setting it to opacity zero and see if that makes it do anything different. Okay, so it did fade it in. So somehow adding a display block is not getting added. Because unfortunately I do need the overlay to like be display none, otherwise I'm not going to be able to click things that are under the overlay. So let's put that back in. Oh, what if I... Okay, by default overlay display none, but, but what if I add display block when it's open? Oh my gosh, did this work? Whoa! That's so weird. What if CSS animations don't actually affect the display property at all? That could definitely be the case. Let's look at this. CSS does CSS animation display block. Because it might just maybe not affect the display property at all. Animation display block display none. That's sort of what I'm looking for. Um, as you know... Oh, one of the properties that cannot be animated is the display property. Okay, so that's why. <laughs> I mean, I guess it makes sense. Although... Intuitively, you would think that you could add an animation from display none to display block and it would sort of understand that you want to fade it in. So I think I don't need to add any display properties in the animation since obviously nothing's happening. And because I'm not doing that, I think I don't even need the 1% thing because I had just done that to make it display block and opacity zero. So let's try this again. Okay, here's the overlay. Header doesn't have open class. Let's click on it. Oh yeah. Okay, so that's a fade in animation. Um, and then let's make another one that's gonna do the opposite, fade out. Fade out from opacity one to opacity zero. Okay, I added the fade in animation when the open class is added. I don't know if it'll work if I add the fade out animation for like the default. Let's just try it. We might need to add a helper class to the actual overlay to fade it in and fade it out. Let's just reload because I want to make sure nothing weird happens with this. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that because I added a fade out animation by default to the overlay, I didn't want it to like fade out when you load the page because that would obviously look very strange. Okay. Clicking on the hamburger menu. Fades it in. Very good. And it just sort of disappears. So it doesn't have the transition, which means the animation is not being added. So let's make this a little bit more reusable. 
So what I'm going to do is I'll just add a little helper class, fade in, and then we'll take this. And instead of applying it specifically to the overlay, I'm going to add it to this helper class here. So we can do the same thing with the fade out. We'll add a little helper class. I think this might be a better practice anyway, because then I can fade in or fade out any element using these helper classes. So I'll just fade out. I do need to leave the display block here just to flip it from display none to display block. But what I think I need to do is in JavaScript, add that fade in and fade out class to the overlay. So if header, if it contains open, remove opens. This is when you close the hamburger menu, just so I don't get things mixed up. Close hamburger menu, else add the open class, meaning open hamburger menu. So when you open the hamburger menu, we want to add the fade in class to the overlay. So let's add a new constant here. Let's call this overlay document query selector, and it's just class of overlay. So when you open the hamburger menu, overlay, class list, add, fade in. Let's just test the fade in functionality now. Going back to our site. Okay, so we can see the fade in class was added and it's adding this animation. And then we'll do the sort of the opposite. We'll say overlay classless add fade out when you close it. And we might need to also remove the, I think I have to remove the fade in class. And then I guess we should also remove the fade out class when we're opening it just to kind of reset everything. Okay, try it again. Reload for good measure. All right, it's fading in. Now it's, what we want to happen is we want the classes to basically swap when we close the menu. So it's fading in, but it's not. Oh, you know what's happening? It's because <laughs> this, when you remove the open class from the header, it immediately just like goes back to display none. Shoot, it's kind of annoying, but I think I need to remove the overlay getting the display block and instead adding it to the overlay element itself. So it doesn't get affected if the header has the open class or not. So overlay, if it has class fade in, this is just going to do the same thing of just making it disappear. Oh boy, this is tough. Okay, fades in, still doesn't fade out. Okay, let's think about this. What's happening step by step? So, okay, going back to zero, this is the default state. You click on this, it will add display block, and then it'll also fade it in. The animation works because going from display none to display block, it's still opacity zero. So it's not going to like show up um, without the nice transition, the animated transition. But then if you remove, if you remove that, then it's going to just display none right away. So what we want to do is make it go from display block to display none after it fades out from opacity one to opacity zero. So let's just research some other possible solutions. Um, CSS animation, display, well, it's kind of what I was searching for before, display none, display block none. See what Stack Overflow has for us. Okay, yep. Changing display none. Da, 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 da. Okay, CSS or jQuery, i.e. JavaScript, can't animate between display none and display block. I see zero visibility hidden. Interesting. I just want to make sure that the stuff is still clickable when we have like a visibility hidden, but it still exists. Get rid of this display none. Get rid of opacity zero. So now it is default display block. Visibility hidden. That's interesting. Oh, it seems like it's actually still clickable. Oh shoot, this might be the silver bullet I'm looking for. Yeah, so it's still clickable, which is awesome. To see what happens is, if it's just opacity zero, it's not clickable. Like I can't select text as easily. Yeah, I can't select the text, but if it's visibility hidden, it does select the text. And I think visibility should be able to be animated. So let's go back here. So fade in, we're gonna go from visibility hidden to 
this might be where we need to just switch it quickly to visibility, visibility, visible, with opacity zero. So we're kind of combining. So it's sort of like display block, but I guess it can be animated for whatever reason. And then we'll do the same thing here. So from opacity one, visibility, visible, we'll go to opacity zero, and then we want it to be visibility hidden. But in order to make it still visibility visible, but opacity zero, we're going to add 99%. So when the animation is almost done, it's going to be at visibility visible, but opacity zero. And then let's see if I need to adjust any of these styles here. I guess I don't need this anymore. Opacity or display none. I think this should work. Famous last words. Let's reload for good measure. Okay, see what happens. Fades in. All right. Oh my gosh, it fades out. Yes. Ah, it always feels so good when you're like struggling with something and you're researching it and then finally get it to work. That's an interesting little lesson, I guess. Like display none is different from visibility hidden versus opacity zero. And they all sort of do different things. Okay. Yay. Let's go back to the mobile view here. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, this is great. Okay, so now that we have our nice fade-in animation of the overlay, next step is to actually code the menu. Now to start off building this off-canvas menu, looking at the design, we can see that it's fairly simple. It's just a white block and each link is in its own row. So what we're going to do is first write the HTML markup, and then I'm going to style it in our SCSS. And then the last step will be to handle the animation and make it slide on screen or fade in or something when you open the hamburger menu. So let's go into our code editor and let's figure out where we want to put the markup for the menu. So obviously we want it to be in the header tag since it is part of the header, the menu is. So I'm going to, I think, put the menu in a div after the nav. So let's call this header underscore underscore menu, maybe? Wait, am I using this already? Oh yeah, I'm using the menu for the hamburger. I think this is more of the menu, so I'm going to rename what the hamburger is. So instead of underscore underscore menu, let's make it underscore underscore toggle. And then I'll just rename this in the styles. So here we go, header menu is now header toggle. Let's just do a quick find and replace here. I'll just add a little toggle here to clarify what that's doing. And let's double check the JavaScript as well. It doesn't look like there's a menu, so we're good on that side. Let's just go back to our site real quick, make sure everything's still working. Okay, overlay and the hamburger icon are still working, which is good. So now let's move forward and create our header menu. The header menu is going to be, you know, that white block. And then in that, we're going to make some links. So let's look back at the design. One, two, three, four, five links. So we'll say a link times five. Again, using that Emmet shortcut. Press enter and we got five links. This is just a landing page, so I don't need to have these actually be links. So it's going to be home about contact blog careers. Boom. About. About. Contact. Blog. It's like a test of my short term memory. And careers. Let's just double check that. Home about contact blog careers. Yay. I think this should be all the markup that we need. Let's go back into the header and then add the styles for the menu. So the menu. So the background is going to be, background will be white. Did I create a variable for the white color? Not variables. White, I did. It'll be background white. And then in that will be links. And I don't think I need an additional class for the anchor links themselves. I think it's just enough that they're anchor links. So that's going to be color and it looks like it's probably the same gray as the header here. So let's go back into our variables and I'm guessing it's the dark blue thing. Now we also need to add a bit of spacing. Get my handy dandy little rectangle here and then we will see first how much spacing there is on the top and bottom of the whole thing. This looks like about 36. It's the same on the bottom. And then each link probably needs some space too. What I might do is do something like this where each link is going to be a certain height, maybe 36. And then let me duplicate this square here. Then I'll add another padding on top and bottom of 26. 
So then each link is going to be, you know, 36, something like this. We can always tweak it later on. So it's going to be padding of top and bottom is 26 and then 36 height for each link. So padding, I guess I need to use a calculator again. 36, no, no, 26 for the padding divided by 16 is 1.625 rems. 1.625 rems on top and bottom and then zero on left and right. I guess we could just do it all around. So we got the padding and then I think I also want to... Now there's a couple ways we could do this. I could, I could add top and bottom padding to the link itself. I could also add the height of 36 and then make it a flexbox parent and align items center. I think I'm just going to add the top and bottom padding. Let's say 10 pixels on top and bottom. That way I don't have to write as many styles as I would if I had to turn this into a flexbox thing. So padding, oops, padding and 10. Going back to calculator, 0.625. And what the heck, we'll just make it all the way around. Now let's see what we got on our site. Now we got our links. It has a white space, but I think that's okay. So I want them to not be side by side and it's happening because anchor links by default are display, I think inline or inline block, one of those. If we change them to display block, then they will take up the whole width that they want, that they can. There we go. So display block, maybe text align center. Oops, turn on the caps lock again. Text align center. Looks like that works. So let's add those styles into our code. Display block. And for whatever reason, I like to order my styles in this way where text align center, where I start with kind of the bigger properties like display and position, flexbox things. And then I move on to margin and padding, and then I do text colors. And then at the end I'll do like transitions or whatever. It's just a way that I like to keep things a little bit organized because when you start getting more rules, you don't want to be searching. So I just try to group these similar styles together. Let's load the site. That looks pretty good. Now the other thing we need to look at is this white block for the menu doesn't take up the entire width, but it looks like, so you can see on the mobile site, there's like a container width. So you have some space on left and right, and it looks like it's kind of sort of the same um, all the way down. Let me refresh my memory and see if I actually added some padding to stuff. Okay, I did add some padding and that's from header nav. So that's just kind of a global padding thing. Okay, so before I do more stuff with the menu itself, I think I need to add some, add this padding that I have here on the header and put it sort of for anything on the mobile page because we want, we don't want things to go all the way to the edge and it looks like things are right now. Cause yeah, like later on, we're gonna need that padding. The padding that I was looking at was on the nav. Okay, I think the best way to do this is to take this padding, not have it nav specific, but make it a helper class, of course. So let's add some spacing. So we'll say the generic container class, and then this will have the padding. So that means we want to go into the nav element and then add the container padding there. Okay, it looks like it's working. So it doesn't have the padding in the nav, but it's in the container class. So now that means we can add this container class to other, other elements. But actually for the container class, I only want the left and right padding. I don't want the top and bottom. So I think what I'm gonna do is take this top and bottom, make it zero for the container helper class, but go back to the header and put the nav selector back and say padding 1.065 rems, zero. Because, oh boy, what did I do? Oh, I know why. It's because this reset the padding. So the nav has the padding just on top and bottom and it's canceling out the left and right padding here. And that's because I'm using this padding shorthand. So the best way to do this is to specify padding top and padding bottom. I use a little control D to duplicate the line. So it's a really helpful shortcut here. And then here it's gonna be padding left and right of 1.5 rems. There we go. Shorthand properties are great, but sometimes you do want to split them out just because you might want different values for different elements. So now the nav has padding all the way across, which is good. And we can start adding the container class padding to other elements. When we have the menu open, we want it to be on top of the overlay and then have that spacing. So I think if I just add the container class 
to the header menu itself should automatically do that. We can't see it right now, but there we go. So we can see there is padding there. Although, wait a minute. I don't want padding. I want margin for that. <laughs> so I'm going to keep the padding because I do need it for like the other content down on the page. But we need to change this padding to margin for just the header menu. So let's get rid of this. And let's take that padding left and right. It's 1.5 rems. We do want it to match the padding that the rest of the container elements are going to have. But we're going to make it a margin instead. So margin. And I think we can use the shorthand, so 0 and then 1.5 rems. So now you can see that it does have that margin, you just can't see it on the page itself because everything's white. So I think we should be good to go now. Let's just take one more look at the design. Okay, so there are some rounded corners, so let's add a border radius to the menu as well. Border radius. Let's try 3 pixels. I think we have enough now that we can start doing the overlay thing. Right now, the header menu is under the overlay because the overlay has, I'm assuming it has a z-index. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't have a z-index because I didn't do it yet. Let's see what we got here. Overlay and then nav is there. Menu's under that. I guess because this doesn't have a z-index set, and that is probably because there's no position property. So if you don't have a position property, it's going to default to position static, which means that anything that has its position set or has a z-index value is going to be on top of it. So let's see what happens if we add position absolute. Okay, so now it's on top of stuff. And let's try with 100%. So you can see it's like going off the screen. So what we want to do is this margin thing isn't actually doing anything because it's position absolute. What you could do is instead of with 100%, you could say with like 90 and then margin. Actually, I don't know if this is going to work because it's position absolute. Yeah, it's not. So since it's position absolute, unfortunately, you can't use the margin auto on left and right to center it because it's like not in relation to anything else. It's absolute. Now, I do want to make that spacing right. So since we had that margin before of 1.5 rems, which is not being used, obviously, I don't know if it's the best way, but I can do a calc and say I want this to be all the way across 100% minus 1.5 rems on either side. So 1.5 times 2 is 3, so 3 rems. Then when we center it, it'll be, it'll sort of be flush to either side for the container. For a position absolute element, you can center it by using left 50% and then transform translate x negative 50%. And what this is doing is left 50% is making it go 50% or halfway across, you know, its container. So that's why it's right in the middle. What transform does is it's going to, let me turn off that left. If you don't have it by default, it's going to be left aligned, right? So if you turn on transform translate X, you're moving it 50% of the object itself. So not the container, but the object itself. So that's why combining the left. So this is the middle line right here. And we want to move it back to be centered, but we only want to move it back this much, half of the width of the element itself. So that's why these combined will give you a centered position absolute item. So let's do this. We're going to copy these things over to our code. There we go. So position absolute, width is the calc, 100% minus 3 rems to have the padding. Then we're doing the left 50% transform translate x, negative 50. I think I need to get rid of this margin. Yeah, there we go. Don't need that anymore. Opening the overlay, now we can see it's nicely centered. And we probably need to add a little bit of space on the top there. Using our little handy dandy rectangle here, let's see how much space that is. About 24. So we are going to do margin top. Where's the calculator? 24 divided by 16, 1.5. There we go. Okay, so now it looks pretty good. I think we might need a little bit more rounded corners. Let's try increasing that border radius a little bit. Maybe five? If I compare the design. It's actually not super round. I think five is good. Okay. So there we have our mobile menu. The next thing we need to do is we want to animate the menu on screen. When the menu is closed, it's going to be off canvas, meaning off you know, your viewport. You're not going to be able to see it. And then it'll somehow animate in. We could either fade it in, we could slide it down from the top, or slide it in from the right. Let's do some research. So go back to CodePen. Search for off canvas menu, maybe? Maybe mobile menu. Maybe animated mobile menu. Get a little more specific. 
Okay, responsive menu with icon. This seems pretty popular. So I'm just kind of getting ideas for, you know, how they're handling this thing. Um, where's the menu? What? Hello? Well, not sure what happened to that. Bootstrap 4 animated menu. You click this thing. So this is interesting. It sort of fades in, covers everything. So that's that's one way we could do it. Sort of similar to the how the overlay sort of fades in and fades out. You could fade in the menu along with the overlay. So that would actually be sort of cool. I think I'm going to do that. <laughs> I was thinking I was going to slide in from the left or right, but fading it in actually seems quite nice. And we can hopefully utilize some of the same styles and animations that we did for the overlay into the menu. So looking again, the overlay it was set at opacity zero, position fixed. Is that right? Wait a minute. It's opacity zero, it's still, you can't click through it. So it is here. Oh yeah, it's not clickable. What did I do? I think I forgot to maybe add visibility hidden. Then we can still select stuff underneath it. Yeah. I just needed to add that visibility hidden. And actually, I, since I'm reusing this for the overlay and also the menu, let's make it a helper class like everything else. So let's see here, visibility. Maybe I should put it in animations. So we're using visibility. So what I'm gonna do is before the keyframes, I'm going to add another helper class. I'll say has fade <laughs> and I'll say visibility hidden. And that's gonna be the default state of any of these elements that we're fading in and fading fading out. Let's see, go to header. Okay, it doesn't have visibility here because I had forgotten it last time. But now I can add the has fade class to the overlay. And if this works, we'll also add it to our menu itself. Let's reload for good measure. Okay, so overlay has fade, visibility is hidden. I can see that I can select through, like the overlay is not preventing me from clicking here because it's the text cursor. Okay, so this is working. So I'm going to add that has fade class also to the menu itself. Go ahead, our menu has fade. So now it's not visible because it is visibility hidden. Let's find the element. There it is. So has fade. So now I can just kind of do the same thing that I did for the overlay in our JavaScript. Scoot this over a little bit so we can see. In our JavaScript, we are, when we open the hamburger menu, we are adding the fade in, fade out to the overlay. We also want to do that to the menu. But since they both have that has fade class, what I could do is instead of having to duplicate both these lines of code for both elements, I could say const, I'll just say fade elements, elements. <laughs> so document query selector. And then if it has that class of has fade, I can hopefully target it with this. Actually, I might need query selector all. Yeah, because query selector, I think will just, yeah, it just gets the first one. So I need to do query selector all. And that's why I'm naming the constant name with a plural instead of a singular. Just little, little hints like that will sort of help you not make mistakes. So let's handle the open stuff first. Fade elms. And I think I can do for each. For each. All right. Can't remember the syntax. Uh, JavaScript for each. I know this is very basic. I admit I'm not super well versed in JavaScript. Here we go. Oh yeah, for each function, yada yada. So for each function, we want to do this. So then in the function, it's going to be element. Hopefully this will work. Okay, so what we want to happen is on both the overlay and the header menu, when we click this, we want it to add the fade in class. Ooh, it worked. Um, what happened here? Weird. It's disappearing for some strange reason. What happened? Maybe let me try removing the has fade class from the menu just to see what happens when it's only on the overlay. Weird. Why is it disappearing like that? That's very strange. Let me try to do it manually. Fade in. Oh, even if I do it manually, weird. Something about the has fade is like canceling this for some reason. Because I had the visibility hidden 
Okay, let's start from the beginning. Adding the class via JavaScript does seem to be working, so that's not the problem. The problem seems to be because of this has fade class, where I set the visibility to hidden. Oh, it's because I think I didn't add the end state for this. Visibility visible. There we go. I think that should work now. Yeah, because the way I'm running the animation, it's going forward, so it's keeping the end state here. So because this was not here, it kind of defaulted back to the visibility hidden from that has fade class. So now things should work. Let's see. Okay, stays like that. Okay, so let's add the has fade class back to the header menu. All right. Oh, I didn't add the other stuff. We just added code for the fade in, which seems to be working. Looks pretty nice. Might speed that animation up a little bit. So let's do the reverse. So we'll do the same thing. Fade elements for each function element. So the element parameter, because it's looping through every element that has the has fade class, you can use the element parameter to target and run functions and stuff like that. So element, element. Okay, so now both the open and close functionality should work. So let's give it a run. Hey, look at that. Nice. Okay, I'm gonna speed that up a bit. It's just a little bit, a little bit slow. So let's do 200 for both fade in and fade out. But I'm pretty pleased how this looks. I think that's pretty good. Now I did want to fix that overlay because when you scroll like this, like the overlay is not going all the way to the top. Overlay, I said top 3.75, how about zero? Oh, it's because I don't want it to be on top of the header, or I don't want it to be on top of the nav. I want the header to be on top of it, but I think that adding the... It should still go all the way to the top. So I think it's because this doesn't have a position set. I think this is position relative. I'm trying to put the nav on top of the overlay. Oh, it doesn't have a background color. <laughs> I was just using it from the, um, the body, but it needs its own background color. There we go. So now it still scrolls and stuff. Let's do that. So to the nav, we'll add position relative and the background color. Relative, background color, white. All right. There we go. So now, oh, I forgot to, <laughs> forgot to remove the overlay thing. Top of zero. Let's reload. Here we go. So now, you know, this looks pretty good. Another thing people do sometimes is when you open the menu, you sort of lock scrolling on the body. So you basically say overflow hidden. So then you can't scroll. So I think I might do that with yet another helper class. So body, what another class of this? We'll just say no scroll. <laughs> so overflow hidden. We are gonna have to add this class to the body when you open the menu. So when you open the menu, we're going to... Oh, I need to add it as, as a constant. Let's add it to the top here. Constant body equals document query selector body. There we go. When you open it, you're going to lock the scroll by adding this class list, add no scroll. And then we'll do the reverse remove. And we'll just put this one first since that's the way we had it in the other one. Let's see if this works. So opening the menu. All right, so we can't scroll. I'm trying to scroll and it's not happening because it wants to keep you on the menu. When I close the menu, it removes the no scroll class and we can again scroll down. Okay. Hey, this is turning out to be pretty good. So we're done with the mobile menu and the next step is going to be going back and adding the rest of the content of the site. All right, now before we start any coding, of course, we want to look back at the design and just have an idea of where we're going with this and how we want things to look on mobile and desktop. So looking at the design, the hero section on mobile is stacked to one column with the image on top and then the copy and button below that. Then on desktop, we have two columns instead of one column with the text on the left and then the image on the right. You might also notice that the images on the hero are slightly different between mobile and desktop. So let's look at our files and see how that is going to be set up. So I have open here my project folder with all the website files, and I already had saved all the images from Fundamentor in this images subfolder. 
So my guess is the background intro desktop is going to be this one. Yep. And then we got one for mobile. This is just that designed background. We need to look for the images of the phones. Probably going to be this image mockups here. What this is, is a PNG with a transparent background. And we can overlay that same image of the phones over the mobile background from mobile and then the desktop background. Going back to the design one more time, we can probably use the same markup for both mobile and desktop. And then we'll use styles to differentiate the styles between mobile and desktop as well. So let's get started. Going into our code editor, VS Code, and we're going to add markup for our hero section. So I'm going to create a section tag and I'm going to call it class of hero underscore underscore just hero actually. Then in the hero section tag, we'll add a div of class. Let's we'll start with the image. So hero underscore underscore image. And under that, we'll do div class hero underscore underscore. We'll just say text. Up in the hero image is going to be the image with the phones and then the background. And then the hero text is going to be under that. And I'm doing it this way because on mobile, we have the image first and then the copy. So then we can just change the style so that the image is going to be on the right for desktop. So now let's go into our files from front of mentor and we want to copy over the text that they gave us. So we don't have to like type it out manually. When you download the files from front of mentor, they give you an index.html file with all the text already there. So I'm just going to copy and paste that over. So hero title is next generation digital banking. Now we need to figure out what HTML tab we want to use. So usually on a website, the H1 tag is going to be the name of the page, but I've also seen it where for a homepage, you use an H1 tag for the hero title. And then why choose easy bank would be H2 latest articles would be H2 and so on. And then we would do H3 tags for these little subtitles here for each section. So yeah, I think I'm going to do next generation digital banking is going to be the H1 tag. We'll do that H1 and it doesn't need a class since there's just going to be one of these. Then we'll copy over this text. Sorry, this goes in the text hero section. There we go. And then I'm also going to add the button and let's kind of look back and see what I had done before or like this request invite button up in the header. Just look for request invite. There we go. So I did an anchor tag with this button class and then a header CTA class. So let's do the same thing here. We'll just use an anchor tag and let's say it's an anchor link. We'll just do a pound and we'll give it a class of hero CTA, but we also need a class of button. So it takes all those button styles that we had built in the previous videos. Request invite is the text in that button. So let's do that. And I think I'm forgetting the, yeah, there's some subtitle stuff here. This is an H1. I think because this is longer, it's not really a subtitle. I'm just going to put it in a paragraph tag. And I don't think I need to put a class on that because we can just use the hero text paragraph tag selector. So let's just do that. Copy this text over. There we go. Oh, wait, <laughs> I already copied this. So I actually don't need this file open anymore. Okay, so I'll just delete this since we don't need it anymore. Okay. So now if we look at our site, we can see that we have the button styles have already gotten ported over, which is great. And then the next thing we want to do is we want to figure out how we want to code the hero image. What I think I want to do is I'm going to create a div and we also need to keep in mind that on desktop, you can see this phone image on the right kind of overhangs the section because the next section has this really light gray background. My guess is that this phone image is going to need to be absolutely positioned. You can sort of guess something needs to be absolutely positioned if it's like on top of something else. So because the phone image is on top of the next section over sort of overhanging it a little bit, we can guess that this needs to be absolutely positioned. There's a couple ways you could do this. You could create a separate div just for the images, which, you know, obviously I have the hero image div. You could also use maybe pseudo elements and then have that absolutely positioned. So what I think I'm going to do is in the hero image itself is where I'm going to put the background image, that SVG sort of designed background. And then maybe I'll store the phone images in a pseudo class or pseudo element, like before pseudo element. So let's try that. So in that case, we actually don't need to add any more markup to the hero image because everything's going to be added in the styles. Let's move on to adding our styles. So in our app folder, I just need to make sure that I'm writing the styles in the correct place. And since this hero section is a new section and it kind of is by itself, let's create a new SAS file. So create new file. We'll call this hero.fcss. And of course we need to add 
the file, importing, importing it into our main SAS file. So we can just close that for now. And then in the hero section, just move it over to the right side so we can sort of see our markup and our styles at the same time. We'll add a selector of hero. Then I'm just going to add the ampersand underscore underscore image, ampersand underscore underscore text. So let's start with the mobile styles first. So in the hero image selector, I want to say background image URL, and we're going to load that. So in the images folder, we want to load the background intro mobile. Now we also want to add some other background style rules. So background size, we're going to say cover. I do that so that you kind of keep the correct aspect ratio of the image and it doesn't, you know, stretch it or whatever, but also it'll fill the space. Then background repeat, no repeat, cause we don't want it to repeat. And then just for good measure, I usually do background position. We'll just do center, center. So it is centered in the div. Now let's see what that looks like in our browser. Okay. It doesn't look like anything. And the reason for that is probably because there is no actual content in the hero image tag. So you can see that there are the styles there, the background image is showing up, but because there's no height, it is not going to show up at all. So what we need to do is figure out how tall we want this div to be. And we'll sort of add that in the styles as well. I'm going to grab my little handy dandy rectangle here. Maybe we'll zoom in a little bit on the mobile design. I'm just going to figure out how tall of roughly do I want this div to be. So it's about 282. So maybe we'll say 280 pixels. So let's say for mobile min height is 280 pixels. And then I'm going to convert that to rems by dividing 280 pixels by 16. 16 is the base font size. So you get 17.5 rems. Now let's take another look at our website. Oh, there we go. So it did now show up. Now this is a little bit wider than mobile, of course. So maybe I'll just turn on the mobile emulator in my browser. So this looks closer to what we want in the design. Zoom out a little bit. So you can see here, we got the background going. So now we just need to add in the image of those phones. And I decided to do that in a before pseudo element with a background image. It doesn't work. We can try something else like using an actual image tag. You know, there's almost always more than one way of building anything. So you don't need to worry too much about finding the one perfect way, as long as it is as simple as possible and it is understandable for yourself in the future or another dev to look at the code and understand how it works. Then I think that you can choose any approach that makes the most sense to you. So the image is image mockups. We'll kind of do the same thing where we're going to do the background size cover and these other background properties. The other thing we want to do is we want to do position absolute. So we're going to need to do that later on. And because this is position absolute, we have to make sure that the parent of the before pseudo element, which is the hero image selector is position relative. Otherwise this image is going to basically, basically fly up out of where you want it to be. So just make sure that when you have position absolute, you make the parent a position relative to keep it sort of within the bounds of the parent. So let's just see what this looks like now. Doesn't look like anything. This is probably again, because, oh, I forgot. <laughs> So when you have a before or an after pseudo element, you need to give it a content property. Otherwise it will just not even exist on the page. This is just a characteristic of using these pseudo elements. Okay. So now we can see in our inspector before is there. So I think what I want to do is maybe add the height and I'm going to set height to hundred percent so that it will match the height of the parent. So let's save that. And what's going on? Oh, there's no width here. So when something's not showing up or doing what you want it to do, it's a really good idea to always check in your code inspector. I'm just trying to figure out and troubleshoot what is causing the issue. So right now the issue we're looking at is why is the phone image not showing up? I look at this before element. I can see that it has zero width, but it does have 280 height because I set the height property. So we're also going to set the width to 100% and we'll see how that looks. Okay. So now we got our phones and they are not quite the right size. I think looking at this, we want the bottom of that phone to perfectly align with the bottom of the background. And that is not what's happening here. This is the bottom of the background. And just for good measure in debugging, I often like to do this. So I'll do a temporary border, one pixel solid. 
let's do magenta. Adding a border will sort of tweak the size of the div, but for most cases, I think it's still okay. Now we see we have a border of the hero image and we have the background going down there, but we want the phones to end on the bottom. We don't want it to be centered like it is right now. So what we want to do is adjust the background position so it aligns from the bottom. For center center, this is the center horizontally is the first center. Second center is the vertical center. Instead of center for vertical, we're going to say we want to position itself at the bottom. So now we can see that the image kind of ends right at the bottom of that hero image div. Now, looking back at the design, I think the phone images are a little bit, yeah, it looks like they're a little bit smaller than what we have in our website. There's just a little bit more space on left and right. So let's go and sort of adjust that a little bit. So the phone images are in the pseudo element, the before element. So how do we make this narrower? What we could do is a couple ways. Right now the width is 100%, so if you decrease that, um, it would sort of decrease, but then you have a case where it's not centered. So then you'd have to add like a margin auto wait display block maybe. Oh, cause it's absolutely, oh, that would be too annoying. You'd have to do left 50% transform translate X negative 50% to center it. That's a little bit too much. So I'm just going to delete those. The better way I think is to keep the width at hundred percent. So it's still hundred percent of the width of the parent. But in background size, instead of cover, cover will basically ensure that the image is going to cover the entire div. So even if it means cutting off from the sides, it'll make sure that it covers everything. And that's usually what we want for things like this, but because I want to make it a little bit smaller, so we can also use percentages in background size. So if you say 100%, it's going to look like pretty close to cover. Yes, yeah, just basically 100% of the div. So if we reduce that, then maybe down to 94. It's reducing the background size, but it is still centered because the width is at 100%, and then we set background position to center for the horizontal. So we'll just adjust that background size, so maybe 93 for that before element. So background size, 93%. Reload for good measure. And that looks, wait, now the bottom isn't matching. Oh, I forgot to save the center bottom. Let's do that. There we go. Now, it is pretty much close to the bottom, not perfectly, but I think that's okay. We'll just sort of live with the imperfection. And then it is kind of in from the sides a little bit. So that looks pretty good. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is the copy for the hero section. So let's look at the design. And obviously it looks a little bit different than what we got here on our website. So it looks like we need to make sure the font is the right font family. Also the color needs to be a bit different. Let's just start with this title, Next Generation Digital Banking. I believe the font family itself should be the same as some of the title fonts that we have. Let's check out our style guide just to make sure what we're doing. Okay, so the font family, we just are using public sans for everything. Weight 300 and 400, 300 is light, 400 is regular. The font still looks a little slightly off. Let's just check this out. It's public sans, so maybe we just need to make the font size bigger. Get this, let's get a rectangle here. And I'm just going to try to guesstimate what size the font is. 30 pixels tall, it looks like. Font size 30 pixels. The font weight seems a lot different in the design. You know what I mean? Like it looks a lot more thin. Seems like that's the font that we're using. And 30 pixels looks different as well. Okay, so maybe 30 pixels is right, but maybe the font weight is not correct. That's 300. What does 400 look like? look any different. For some reason, the H1... Oh, I bet it's because the H1 tag, it's not going to show this here, but usually the browser default will set all font weights to bold. So font weight, here we go, 300. Now it looks a bit closer to the weight in the design. Going back to our hero dash file, so in the hero text section, we'll add another selector for H1, and we'll say font weight is 300. And font family has already been chosen in the global dash file. Everything is public sans. I'm just going to close this animations thing too. All you need to do here is the font weight of 300. And then the color is this sort of dark blue. So in our variables dash file, it's this dark blue variable. And we'll say color dark blue. And usually what I do for headline tags is I'm going to at a line height of about one. I'll just put it in the h1 tag line height one. 
usually for headline tags, title tags, you want the line height to be around one, maybe slightly bigger. And then when you have body copy, like paragraphs, where you have like longer, longer amounts of text, then you want the line height to be a bit greater than that, like 1.3 or 1.5, depending on the design. Font size, I think I said was 30. Let's get the calculator out. 30 divided by 16 is 1.875. 1.875 rems. Much closer to what we want here. I think maybe 30 might not be big enough, actually. That's 37. Font size, 37 pixels. Going back here. Okay, that looks much closer in size. I think I need to increase the line height a little bit. Maybe 1.1? Maybe 1.2. A little bit less. Let's do 1.15. Just kind of meet in the middle there. All right, so let's copy these styles over. So I think I said font size was 37 pixels. I need to convert that. 37 divided by 16 is 2.31. Just round a little bit here. And then line height was, I think, 1.15. All right, and we need to center the text here. It seems like most of the content on mobile is centered. So I think maybe for now, I'll just set text align center for the entire hero section hero text we can do it there text align center and then we'll change it to left align for the desktop media query there we go so going back to the hero let's add the selector for the paragraph in the text hero text area and we'll say line height and i'm not sure if this is right yet but maybe 1.5 to start off and it's going to be inheriting the font size of 14 pixels Spacing looks okay, and we also need to figure out some of the spacing under the headline to the paragraph. So this is something like 24, and then under the paragraph above the button, so maybe something like 37 or 36. So 24 space under the headline, 36 space under the paragraph itself. So H1 by default will inherit the styles in the browser, which we don't necessarily want. I want to basically take out this top margin that just gets added to the headline tags. I usually try to add space between elements by adding margin to the bottom of things, not to the top. Here, headline tags. So we'll say h1, h2, h3, margin top of zero. There we go. Now I'm going to go back here. Now it's all the way up to the top. We'll add spacing in the hero text area itself, but for the margin bottom, right now it's about 30. And I think it was 24, so under the hero, margin bottom, 24 divided by 16, 1.5 rems. And then in the paragraph, we're adding a margin bottom of, I think it was 36 pixels divided by 16, 2.25 rems. Now, looks a bit closer to our design, eh? So the space between the paragraph and the button now, which is pretty good. We need to figure out the space above the headline and to the end of the thing. So it actually looks pretty similar to 36. So 36 on the top, on the bottom it's all the way up to 87. So I think what I want to do is, ideally, at least in my mind, you would probably want the same amount of space at the top and bottom of each section. So this space here should be the same amount of space as up to here. 85 seems like a little bit, but I think We'll do maybe 60 pixels as kind of like the wrapper. That way I can put it in a helper class, which means I can then just add the wrapper class to each section that I want to add that space. And so we kind of make our styles a little bit more consistent and a little bit simpler. All right, so I said container padding left and padding right. As you can see here, container has, has padding of 24 on the left and the right. So I added padding top and bottom just for the nav, and then I had added padding left and right for the container, and that is equal to 24. So let's do that first, the left and the right spacing, by adding that container class, and then we'll move on to adding the top and bottom spacing. So hero text, I think maybe? Let's just see if we can do that there, container. And then go back to our website. So now you can see here, the hero text has this space, and I didn't want to do it on the hero image because that one kind of goes to the full left and right. Let's see if I add the container then it kind of messes up the alignment that I had going. Okay, so now I've got the hero text. It has a padding on the left and right, which is good. Kind of matches what we have here with the image of the phone. So now I'm going to think of a way of creating that top and bottom spacing 
with a helper class. You know, do I want to add it to the container or do I want to add it somewhere else? Because not everything wants to have that top and bottom padding. I'd only use the container thing in the nav. So I wonder if in the container I could add padding top and bottom of, I think I said 60. Let's think about this. If I add it to the container, that would be good for this because then it has a space on top and bottom and left and right, but then it would also take effect in the nav and I don't want that. Let's just add it to the container and see where, you know, it kind of breaks the design. So 2.25 rims. I'll do the same thing for bottom. You might do the same thing as me, but when I'm going around for adding padding or margin, I always start from the top. Actually, right should be next. Top, right, bottom, and left is last. Let's just check on that now and see how this looks. So, going to our rules, you can see header nav. It has a padding top and bottom, which I had set previously, which is good. If we scroll down to the container, you can see that it did have the padding top and padding bottom of 2.25 rems, but that got overridden by the more specific rule of header nav. This is because using the class of header within the child nav is more specific than the than just the general class of container. Just curious, what if I do header container? Okay, so in, in that case, that would be more specific, probably because the first rule is using the class of header and then the element of nav. Whereas the class of header and class of container, class is more specific than the element itself. That's why this would override the class header nav selector. So it's almost like rock, paper, scissor. Class beats element selector, but then ID selector will beat class selector. It's just something that is good to know when you're working with CSS a lot. Looks like we have our container stuff all set. Go back to our mobile view and just kind of double check on that. Things look a little better, right? We're getting more spacing added. We spacing on top and bottom, and we have this... See the button is kind of going into the bottom padding? I believe that's because I probably need to set display inline block. Because I think by default, if I don't say anything, it's just going to be... An anchor tag is going to be display inline. So making it display block will make it have to follow the, the rules that I've set for padding and stuff. So now you can see, having set display inline block, the button is now inside the content and not going into the padding. Wait, and that's in the header. So I might need to move the button rules out of the header SAS file just because there's places outside of the header that are using the buttons. Let's do display inline block at the top. So now this actually looks pretty good. We got our hero section for mobile. Looks like everything is good in terms of spacing. Got our button going. Looks like the hover state's not working on that. You see I have that hover state on the top. Let's we'll see where those rules are coming from and make sure that they get applied to all buttons. So in the inspector, I'm gonna select that top header button, click on the hover, and if you check this hover box, it'll sort of force the hover state so you can see which style rules are getting applied. So it looks like, yeah, the hover is part of the header CTA rules. And I want that to be applied to any button. So let's go into our header SAS file. That was under the CTA. So font size, font small. So I wonder if I need to make the font size and color in the button itself. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Let me move this globals over here. What I want to do is I'm going to take the font size from the CTA, the header CTA button, and put it in the global button rules. Let's just do it down here. Font size and then the color is white. It's already set there so I don't really need that. This can also also just be copied over so I'm just going to delete this header CTA. Now all the styles that we need are going to apply to all buttons since we're saving it in the global SAS file. Let's try this again. Now we can see the hero button has that nice little hover state. You don't always have to write your styles perfectly the first time because a lot of things you just kind of figure out as you build the, the website. There's always going to be going back and sort of correcting things and tweaking things depending on issues that come up as you're building out this website. There's nothing at all wrong with going back and changing your work a little bit. Now that we have our mobile styles for the hero, let's add the desktop styles. Going back to our design, you can see that the hero was one column on mobile with the image first, then the text. And on desktop, it is two columns with the text on the left and the image on the right. So what we're going to do is add some flexbox to this. What I want to do is in the hero selector, add display flex to turn on flexbox. But I only want this rule to take effect for desktop widths and up. 
what I've done before was I created a mixin SAS file and we have our breakpoint up mixin that I can then use to add the media query. So we'll say include breakpoint dash up and then in the parameters the size we want to hit we're going to focus on the large and up. So then I can move this rule into the breakpoint media query. So just by adding this one rule let's look at our website and see how that looks for desktop. Okay so you can probably guess what's happening here. The hero image doesn't have any height, but we can see that Flexbox is turned on. There we go, Flex1, and then we'll add Flex1 to the hero text as well. And this is just to start off to kind of make both of them the same amount of space. But you can see that, let's add that Flex1 in the desktop width to both the image and the text selectors. So we'll say flex of one and we'll change this later on but we just kind of want to get things started now you can see that there is height because adding the flex of one it makes the child flex element be the same height across both of the flex child elements you notice in the design the image is on the right for the desktop but because in the market we added hero image first that's why it's on the left so that's another thing you can do in flexbox is you can adjust the order so we want the image to be second on desktop. I think it's flex order. No, I think it's just order. And we want it to be two, so we want it to be second, and we want the text to be first. So order of one. There we go. Second thing we need to do is look at the heights, because this looks like it's not quite tall enough compared to the design. So on desktop, the hero image is about, and we're not going to take into consideration this overhang here, because the section itself ends just about down here. So 655 pixels tall. So there's a couple ways we can do that. We can, of course, adjust the hero section itself to be 655 pixels tall, or we can make the image 655 pixels tall, and then we know that the text will sort of take the same height. So hero image, what happens if we say height of 655 pixels? So now we can see that it is taking up more space, which is what we want. So let's just say minimum height for desktop. And that's 655, 5 by 16 to get 40. Let's just say 41 rems. Doesn't need to be perfectly exact. But going back here, so now it's taller. We do want to center the text. We want to center the content in the flexbox in the flexbox parent. In the hero flexbox parent, you can say align items, enter. This will automatically vertically align everything. So now of course what we need to do is we need to make this hero image the height of the parent hero. We can do that by in the desktop breakpoint, say height is 100%. So we'll take the height of the parent. Hmm, let's see, let's see, let's see. I bet it's because in flexbox it's kind of intelligent so it'll size things based on the content, and because the image has no content, it's really looking to the hero text element for the height. So I think actually I do need to move the height from the hero parent selector to the hero image. Let's try this. I'll just say height. Okay, so there we go. So this is a little more like what we're hoping it'll look like. I'm gonna get rid of that magenta outline. I don't really need that anymore. So we're getting there, right? Text is centered on the left. We've got our image on the right. The height is pretty much what we want. Now we need to make sure that the image is correct because if you remember we had two different ones. Here we go. Right now it's just loading the mobile one. And get another media query and then for the image I'll say background intro probably desktop. So now it's loading the desktop. So let's check on the design again. Looks like the phone sort of starts here kind of toward the end of that blue little wavy section. So we need to move that background over a little bit so we can see the end. We'll adjust the background position because right now it's just centered. I'm just testing it in the browser. It's a little bit quicker that way. Horizontally I really want it to start from the left side of that background image. So we'll say left, center, we'll center it vertically. So this is actually a little bit, the phone's a bit down from the top of that gray blue section. So what happens if we do bottom? Oh, have it left top. Oh, actually, I think we can leave it left center, but what we want to do is adjust the mock-up so that they're down. So we can do something like top 10% or something. Then at least it's going to be a little bit closer to being under there. And we also, looks like we want to move it over a little bit, but let's just focus on this background stuff right now and copy over the style so that I don't forget what I did. The background position left center for desktop. 
for hero image. Hero image, desktop, new background image, and now it's also going to have a new background position. That looks pretty good. We'll adjust how the phones are positioned over the background image after we make it the right width, because right now this is 50% and then the image is 50%, but in reality th there's more width given to the images. So now what we're going to do is going to go back into our hero section SAS file, and we're going to adjust the flex child properties. The first one was image, and the image one was a wider one, so we'll set that flex of three. Then for the text, it's going to be two. So what these numbers mean is the available space in the parent gets allotted to each child. And it's kind of like a ratio. Image is going to get three parts, and then the text is going to get two parts. Okay, so it looks a little bit closer to the design, right? So there's more more space given for the image, and then a little bit less space for the for the text. Now I think I also need to make sure that we're using that container to have a max width set. Because right now everything is just going across. So this is 1240. Oh yeah, it's going all the way across. So what I think I need to do is for the container helper class, which I already added, which is good, I'm gonna have to add a max width. Let me just show you what that will look like. Max width, and I think it was 11, 13 pixels. And then we're going to have a margin of auto. It'll center it. So then anything with the container helper class is going to have a max width set, and then it'll be centered if the width is larger than that. Going back to our code editor, and I believe it's in our globals. So max width is going to be, I said 11, 13, just according to the design. Maybe we'll round it down 11, 10. And then turn it into RAM 69.375. Rems. And then margin of zero on top and bottom, and then auto left and right, and that will center the container. Now we go back to here, so we can see the header now is centered nicely. It's limited to that 11, 1110, and then we're going to add that container class to the hero as well. Ooh, this is going to be tricky because I used the container class in the hero text to add that padding for the mobile styles, but I think if I just add the container class to the hero itself, Hopefully the padding on the left and the right should stay from mobile. Let's just go back to mobile styles and make sure that we have the spacing that we wanted here. There's two things we want to do. We want to control the max width to have that container, but then we also want to add padding around the sections. What we could do is I could split it out into two different helper classes, like a container class and then wrapper or some other generic word like that. Or I could add some modifiers to the container class where I could add padding and then add the that special modifier class. Sounds pretty good. Let's try that. If you just have a container, the most important thing I want to do is to have that max width and the auto margin. Keeping in mind that there are cases that I want to only add padding to one side or maybe I want it to add to all sides except for the top. What if I did something like adding a modifier where it's container padding top and then if you have that, it gets the padding top and then I could do the same thing. There we go. So now we have the padding. But there might be cases where I want the padding all the way around. There might be cases where I just want it maybe top and bottom or just left and right. So I think I'll create maybe two more helper class modifiers where it's padding just top and bottom. Let's just say padding Y. That's kind of the vertical axis. And then for that we'll add padding top and padding bottom. And then if I want padding only on the left and right, we'll say padding X for horizontal. Then we'll add padding, adding right, and adding left. It looks like I'm taking up a lot of space by creating these extra classes, but it'll save me time when I'm creating the markup later on because now, let me show you what I can do. For the, the header, I want padding all the way around. So I can say, maybe I should add one more helper class where it's P all, and then this one is going to have everything, all the options. So now, I know it says pal, we can now add container, P-A-L-L, -L, to the nav. And then for the hero, we can say container P-X. And see the hero container, oh, actually I didn't want any padding on this at all. Now it's like this, change that. Okay, hero container. Now this is good, there's no padding here. But I need to add padding to the hero text, so what I could do there is add container, maybe padding all because it's in the text element. There we go. Now we got container padding all. This is good too because I'm not adding the max width rule to this element. 
It won't hurt anything, it won't break the side, but it's just not really needed. I'm pretty happy with this. But then let's check out on desktop. We got hero container, which is fine. And then the header, if you look in the nav, it has a container max width set, and then it has the padding all the way around, which is perfect. All right, uh, I had to um, adjust the lighting there because as I was recording the last video, the sun was kind of going down, so things were just getting darker and darker. But now it should be all set. So back in our hero section, um, I think the next thing we want to do is let's fix the hero text styles because I think in the design, it is left aligned as opposed to being centered like it is here. Let's go into our hero styles and here we go. So text, text line center is what we set as the default mobile styles. That's kind of an example of mobile first styles where your mobile styles are the default styles without any media queries. And then you add on your desktop and so on styles using a media query. You know, that looks, and there we go. But I wonder if the text styles are bigger on desktop perhaps? Oh yeah, definitely bigger. I think before it was maybe 37, is that right? 37, yeah. Let's estimate what the desktop H1 font size is gonna be. 40, 52, let's try 52. Font medium. Well, I guess we'll just add font maybe X large, just in case we need something between 18 and 52. So 52 divided by 16 is 3.25. So now for the, the hero text section, H1, we want to add include breakpoint up large and font size is going to be that font X large. So there we go. So now it looks more close to the design where the line breaks at next generation and then digital banking on the next line. Let's just, while we're at it, double check our body copy here. So it looks like it's a little bigger on desktop as well. Let's see how big this is going to be for desktop. Like it's about maybe 20, maybe 19. Let's just say 20. I guess font, oh boy, medium, maybe large for 20 pixels. 20 divided by 16 is 1.25. So that was for the body. It's in the global SAS file. Here we go. So font size, font small. We'll add our include break point up. Large. Font size, font large. Looks pretty good. Looks smaller on the design. Let's take that down to maybe, you know, let's just try 18 since I already have that variable saved. That looks pretty close to the design. I'm happy with that. Now we need to tackle the more tricky part, which is this hero image section. The problem with this is that we want the hero content to have that container, right? So the max width is set, but for the hero image, we actually want this to go outside of the container. Oh, also the image goes all the way up to the top of the um, header. And actually, oh my gosh, it looks like, cause the header's white, but then this hero background I thought it was white, but it actually looks like a very, very, very light gray. That's pretty subtle. Okay, so they did have that already set, which is great. So I think I can just add it to the hero selector. I'm assuming we want that for mobile as well. Background color, very light gray. Okay, so now it's very light gray. But now you can see here we have this problem where the container is limiting the width, so the gray is not going all the way out. I think I still will have to add the container class to a child of the hero container or just of the hero rather. So it will be something like this class equals container and that container will move the hero image and the hero text divs kind of like this. Now going back into our browser, oops, I need to add the flexbox stuff, play flex. Oh, this is a problem. So the flex styles, you want to put that in um, hero container. Okay, so now it looks better. Let's just double check that it looks okay on mobile. That looks okay. Okay, so we'll go back to desktop. Now we got our very light gray background color and we need to figure out how to make this image going all the way to the right side. So I wonder if it would make sense to make this position absolute on desktop. Cause if it's position absolute, then I can kind of position it and make it like right zero or whatever. Oh gosh, got rid of the height. 100%? Will that fix it? No. 
Oh yeah, width is not working either. That's not right. Also, I think I need to add the container to have position relative. There we go. This is kind of a mess. Let me think about this again. Okay, so this looks okay. It's just the image that's not really working for us. Ooh, what if I do something like, I know I'm already storing the mockups in the before element, but what if for desktop, I put the background, background image SVG into the after pseudo element. So then I can absolutely position that, but then the flex styles don't get messed up. Let's try that. What have I got to lose, right? So we have this before class here, I have the after. It's actually gonna look quite similar to the before. So I might just copy this and then just change the actual image. So I think since I'm gonna move the background image here, I'm just going to comment it out here, you know, to kind of cover my, cover my butt in case I need to go back to this. So let's try this again. Okay, um, we got two background images. As, now it's loading the mobile, so what I actually need to do is background image, none. Okay, so now we just have the desktop thing. Now the ZNX stuff is a little messed up. The reason the background image SVG is on top of the mockups is because the background image is in the after pseudo element, which is coming after the before pseudo element. And how CSS works is if you don't sort of designate explicitly what the ZNX is, it's going to put elements later on on top of elements before. I guess I could fix this relatively easily by just switching the before and after. So this will become before, E4, it'll become after. And then the order doesn't really matter, but just for the sake of being more clear, I try to put the before pseudo element before the after pseudo element. Now let's see that. Okay, so now the uh, phones are on top, which is good. So let's think about this. The background is not big enough. You can see it's much bigger in the design where it's like kind of off the page. I guess part of the problem is the width has to be bigger than the width of the parent. So what if we make the width bigger? Ooh, hey, this is looking better. Because it looks like the phones are about the right size. Let's try one, let's just go for 150. Width of 150, not too bad. It just seems a lot taller. The green part's going straight off the screen. We can try to fix that a little bit later. Okay, so we got this to be 150 width. Now the problem with this is that looks like it's actually starting under the careers, fit between blog and career. That's where the left edge of this image is. And it's also going off. So what if I do left of 20%? And this is going off the screen, which seems to be part of the design. So we'll just keep moving it off screen. The phones are a little bit down. So let's say top 5%. That's not what I want. So I think I need to do transform, translate Y. Oh, shoot. Also background size is 93%. Let's try contain. So that looks better because all the phones are visible. Was it what, 93% first? I'll just try to maybe match the size of the design. So it's going up all the way. It's getting cut off just above that 74,000 thing. So 97% perhaps. So it's actually looking pretty okay. Let's move it a little bit to the left. That looks pretty good. And it looks like this needs to be down a little bit more. So let's translate it down. I'm not actually sure if translate is gonna be the way to go for this because it's getting cut off. But the problem is I want where this gets cut off to like stick to the top. I think I'm gonna uncheck the transform because this looks pretty close to the design, right? You can see this is going right up to that top nav bar. So I think I will maybe increase the size a little bit. And then I think I just need to make the uh, after pseudo element a little bit smaller. Let's just worry about the background image first. I kind of just want to start over. So let's reload to refresh all the styles. Okay, so let's start with just the intro desktop SVG. The problem with this was it's not big enough, right? So what I did was I increased the width to 150, which looks good. So let's put that in the code before. We'll add a little breakpoint here, include breakpoint large width of 150%. One style saved. Now the problem is, is that it's not going down all the way to, like the blue in the design is going all the way down to the bottom. And this is not. Weird. Let me actually add some outlines to both of these just so you can see a little bit what I'm doing. Okay, so now I can see a little bit better, hopefully. Wait, why did that not make an error? Oh, there's an error. There is an error. 
Oh, no mix in name breakpoint. Okay, I was typing some wrong stuff in there. Breakpoint up. Now this magenta border should show up. There we go. You know what? I'm just going to hide this right now. I can just focus on the background thing. Okay, so this needs to move down all the way down to the bottom of that hero. Let's just do 15. Hmm, okay. If on big screens it's gonna see more, I don't want it to like get cut off. Something like this, where at least you can see that bottom edge. Okay, CSS is hard, guys. Don't let anyone tell you it's easy. Let's just add a little more space. The green is actually getting cut off, whereas in the website, it's, you know, not going all the way up. I think I'm just not making it large enough. Now I need to move it a little bit. Okay, so 0%, 83%. That actually looks pretty good. It's still a little bit taller, so... Okay, it actually is getting quite close, which is great. This, this looks pretty close. I'm going to copy this and we'll add it to these styles. No repeat is fine. And then background position and background size change. See, this is looking closer and closer. Now we need to just kind of position the phones. A lot of times when we're coding and building stuff, we try to just do everything at once. Like I was trying to do like the background SVG and also the phone mock-up at the same time, but it's quicker in the long run for me to just focus on one thing at a time. So what I did was I focused just on that background SVG, got that, and then now I can work on positioning the phones. I think you'll be more successful doing it that way because you aren't splitting your attention between two different things or three different things, trying to figure them all out at once. It's much easier when you just separate things out and just attack one problem at a time. So now these phones actually look pretty close. Now, of course, it's not going all the way down under here into the next section. So we do need to figure that out. Let's just get this to 100%. Or right, let's do contain. Oh, let me think about this. The reason that this keeps getting cut off, like I was doing background size 100% and then I was trying to do like top 5% or something to move it down, but I don't want this to get cut off, right? I think it's because the height is always going to be the same. So what if I make the height taller than the parent, which is the case, right? Because you're looking at the design, the phone starts at the top and it extends beyond. So it's like 100% plus a little more. So let's try height of 110% maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. So you can see now things are moving down, which is good. I'm really just overhanging a little bit. It's down a little bit too much. Bring that top thing back, maybe negative two. But it's not going up here, so I wonder if I need to increase the background size. Yeah, so background size, let's just kind of guess here. 120 maybe. So the width also needs to be greater than the hero image div. Because remember the hero image div is limited by the flexbox properties. That's why it's only 637. Whereas this one needs to be wider and taller than the parent. So let's increase this as well. And because we're increasing the width, the size of the background image is increasing too. So we can take that down by decreasing the background size. So just a little bit of like, kind of finagle things around. So let's start trying to align this leftmost phone near that puzzle piece thing. So we'll add a left property, start with 0%, and we'll kind of increase it, and then we can see it going about maybe there. Yeah, maybe a little bit less, so 22% perhaps. I think we need to move it up a little bit because it looks like the corner of this phone is just getting into that green area. So we'll move it up, maybe that much. It's pretty close, I think. And then let's see how f if this is kind of the right look that we got here. So it's, yeah, overhanging just a little bit. Now, of course, we don't want this to go all up into the header. I think actually we don't want the, we want the top to always be zero. I think this looks pretty good. We do want to move this up a little bit, right? But I think we can maybe control that not with the element itself, but with the background position, because I said center bottom, if I do center zero percent. And then I use that. So then what this is doing is it's adjusting the background image within that div. So if it if the background image goes over, it's not going to show that overlap because it's just the background image, it's not the div itself. It can be kind of tricky. The more time you spend doing this kind of stuff, the more you'll sort of understand how things work and how different properties fit together and like what they do. 
this looks pretty close. Background size should be a little bit more. Let's try 95 and then we'll kind of move it down as we need to. I think I can actually erase this top property because it's just zero. So let's take this, these properties. Oh yeah, and the width and height properties too. Make sure we copied that over and then put them into our SAS file. Oh wait, this is for just desktop. I don't want to delete the mobile styles. There we go. Okay, so we don't need this image mockups because it's the same as the mobile styles. Everything else is changing. Um, we don't need the no repeat. Let's um, remove this border stuff because we don't, don't want to be distracted by that. Now this is looking pretty close to the design, I think. If we increase the width, you can see, you know, it is going to nicely stay flush to that right edge. We have the mobile design. That looks, I think that looks pretty close to what we had. But then for tablet, it's looking a little weird, right? So I think one fix for that could be just to increase the size of the hero for, for tablet. Hero image. So min height is 17.5, which is 280 pixels. If you want to know how many pixels something is, if it's using another unit like REMS or EMS, you can check in the computed. That'll give you the sort of resulting pixel size. So this one was min height of 280. Obviously that's not quite tall enough for tablet. So let's say min, min height of maybe 400 pixels. You don't want it to be too tall because you do want the whole hero to, I think, fit in the viewport when you're loading it in a tablet, but maybe just a little bit shorter. Hero image, I have the background here and then the mockups. Ooh, this was not in a media query, loading the desktop image. That's not good. That might be why it looks slightly strange here. Okay, let's fix that first. So in the before pseudo element, I need to move this into a media query. Looks like I just put it in the default styles. Let's think about this again. So I change things where I load the mockups in the after pseudo element and then the background images in the before pseudo element for desktop, but the background image for mobile is in the hero image element itself. So I could actually move all of these properties into desktop, I think. Actually, I don't need the width, I do need the height. Maybe I'll just comment things out just to, in case I need to bring it back. Okay, so this still looks good on desktop and then on mobile, it's only loading the mobile background because before it was loading like both. Let's go back to this section and we wanted to change that min height, right? Let's try 400 pixels. And then I wanted to try background position, maybe center top for the mockups, which is in the after. So background position, center, top. I feel like center bottom was better. We'll leave it center bottom and then we're going to make the min height 400 pixels and we will convert that to rems. For medium, break point up, medium, 400 pixels divided by 16 is 25 rems. For large, it's just height of 41. So here's the thing on mobile, here it is on tablet, and here it is on desktop. And it takes a second to load that thing on desktop. I don't know if I'm happy with this. It's too big, I think. So maybe for medium, we can do something like background size is something like this. 52%. So hero image after background size is 52% for medium. Medium background size 52%. Just so we can remove this commented out thing. Ooh, what did I do? Hmm, I might have put it in the wrong property. Oh, the before suit element, after suit element is what I need for the mockups. Move that down there. This should work now. Okay, that looks closer to what we had. That is okay. Let's just tweak this tablet background image again. So I think I want to make it background position bottom. So let's try center bottom or center. So then at least it's sort of like closer to like what the mobile thing was. Center 60. So background position center 60 for hero image on medium. There we go. Okay, so I think this looks a little better, right? And it is hard because I'd say 99% of the time, if you're in any kind of design, you know, work situation or whatever, the designer is usually only going to give you a mobile design and then desktop design, which you can see was the case here with front end mentor. So for tablet, a lot of times it's kind of on you to figure out, okay, what combination of like mobile styles and desktop styles am I going to do for mobile, um, for tablet, I mean. So this is tablet and this is phone. 
and then this is up. All right, now before we start any actual coding, we're of course going to look at the design and figure out how we're going to build this. So we're going to be building the feature section, which is this Why Choose Easy Bank section under the hero. On desktop, you can see that they're in four columns, and then they stack on mobile to a single column. For tablet, I'm guessing I might do a two column layout. Now for this section, I think what I'm going to do is build this using Flexbox. Now there's a lot of cases in layouts where you can use either Flexbox or CSS Grid. I do want to show you both, so I think what I'm going to do is build this top section using Flexbox, and then for the next section under it, the articles, I'm going to use CSS Grid for that. In my opinion, I think you could use either Flexbox or Grid for both of these sections, and it would be completely fine. Let's get started writing the actual code. So if we go into our code editor, we'll go to our index.html file, and let me just minimize the hero section since I don't need that anymore. And we'll create a new section tag, and we're going to name it feature. Okay, or maybe I'll say features since there's multiple features, just to make it a little bit more clear. Now the first thing we're going to add is the text above the four features. It says why choose easy bank with some subtitle and that one is full width on desktop. So it's kind of the same for desktop and mobile. So let's add that here. We'll give this an H2 tag and then we'll copy over the text why choose easy bank. Then under that, I'm going to create a paragraph tag and I will copy the paragraph text over there. Okay, so then under the intro text is going to be the feature grid. Since we're using Flexbox, the first thing we need to do is we need to create the parent element, the parent flex element. So I'll say div and I'll give it a class of feature, feature underscore underscore grid. There we go. And then in that parent flex element, I'll create some more divs. So div class feature, maybe item. So each feature is going to have this div feature item. Let's go back to the design really quick. Each feature has a icon image, then it has a title, and then it has sort of a description. So I need to add markup for all those things. So the first thing I'll say is div class feature. Actually, I don't think I need to type in div. If I just say dot feature underscore underscore, let's say icon, then we'll say feature underscore underscore title, and then feature description. There we go. So now we can add the different icons that we need for the icons and then the text as well. So for the icon, let's see what we got in our images folder. So these are the image files from Front Mentor that we're adding into our project. So I'm guessing it's one of these icon API, etc. In our code, we can say image source and then add the source as the SVG file. Let's copy in our text as well. So what I'm doing here is I'm just building the first feature block just by itself. I'm not copying this three times that I have all four. The reason for that is I don't wanna duplicate it until I know exactly the correct markup and styles that I'm going to use. So I'm just using this first one as kind of the first test case. Let's see how that looks. And I'm really just seeing to make sure the icon image is loading correctly, which it is. I haven't added any other styles, so it doesn't really look like much right now. So let's go back into our code editor. And I think this markup should be okay, but let's start adding these styles. So in our app folder, in our SCSS subfolder, I'm probably going to create a new SAS file called features or feature. I haven't decided which one I want yet. I'll create a new file underscore feature. I'll just say feature. Then I'm gonna move it over to the right so we can see everything. Yeah, so I'll do features as the section tag. And then for the feature grid itself, we'll just use the feature name. So feature. So I'm going to add underscore underscore grid, item, icon, title, and description. And this is using the BEM or block element modifier approach to writing your SAS styles. I personally really like it just because it keeps everything in a compact file with just the styles related to these feature blocks. So the first thing we wanted to do was create a style for the feature grid to use Flexbox. Let's go back to the design. We do need Flexbox on desktop to make those four columns for the features, but on mobile, everything is just in one column. So this doesn't actually need to use Flexbox. I'm only going to turn on Flexbox for desktop. So I'm going to use that media query breakpoint, mix in, breakpoint up, large, and then I will turn on Flexbox with display flex. Um, we're probably going to be adding some styles to the feature item for flex as well. So kind of get that started here. And let's just start out saying flex of one. All four of these feature items will be on the same row. 
I'm guessing this markup is probably fine. So I'm going to take this and just duplicate it. And that's using the Control D shortcut. So I'm going to save this and I know it's all the same item right now, but I just want to make sure the styles look okay. Okay, looks like Flexbox is not working for some reason. And let's go back and see what happened. So we have the correct rules, but actually I didn't include the feature SAS file in our main SAS file. So it's always important to remember that. Now let's look at the browser again. Okay, things are next to each other, which is good. I just want to kind of add some spacing so we don't get distracted by those other the other text underneath. Let's go back into our section tag and I'm going to add some of those container classes that we created last time to add padding. This container, container P-A-L-L -L for padding all should help. And I'll put it in the features section tag. There we go. So it's a little bit better. And this is one benefit of using these utility classes like the container class and container padding classes that I created because instead of having to manually write styles saying padding top, you know, 2.25 rems, etc., I can simply create the utility class and then I can use it in any HTML element that I want and it'll automatically take the styles. So it's good because it's easier when you're creating new markup. Also, you don't have to write duplicate styles because I know these are all taking the same, the same padding. And of course, we'll, we'll probably have to tweak this a bit later on, but right now we're just trying to get the basics down. One thing that we need to remember with Flexbox is that Flexbox does not automatically include gap spacing between flex child elements. Unlike CSS Grid where you have the gap property, it's not included, at least not right now. I think Firefox is working on this property, but it's not universally used. Even though I'm using Firefox in my browser, I'm going to manually add spacing using probably the margin property for these flex child items. Let's look at the design again and sort of think about what we want to do. We need to add some space between these flex items and it's hard to tell exactly how much the space is because the text is left aligned. So you're not always going to have consistent spacing between items, but we can make an educated guess here, right? So I'm using this little rectangle that I created in Adobe XD using the, the rectangle tool up here. And it's just an easy way for me to kind of eyeball how much space and how big things are. This, you know, the space is going to be at least this much, maybe more. It says 29. In this case, it's 46. I think we're going to stick with the 29. So what I need to do is I need to add spacing between the flex items. Now you might think, okay, well, the easiest way to do this is to simply add spacing. I could add a margin right so that it would be between each of these items, right? And that would look fine on desktop, but what happens when we're going to tablet? And earlier I said I want for tablet to be two columns. In that case, if there's space between each item, when you stack them two and then two underneath, the second item in that flex row is going to have extra spacing on the right, so it won't look very good. So we need to figure out what we want to do about that so that it doesn't look weird on tablet when you have less than two flex items in a row. Now we could handle this a couple ways. So one way would be in our styles, we could say, for the flex child items, we'll add a margin right of 30 pixels or whatever, but only for desktop. And then for tablet, we could say for every other item, it would have that margin right. So then you wouldn't have that spacing. Then you could do something like in each feature item, you would add padding to the feature item. And then the content would automatically have a certain amount of spacing. So how that would look would be, we want to add spacing so there's space between the items, but instead of margin, we're going to add padding. Because there's 30 pixels of width between items, you'd add half of that to the side padding for each item. Each item is going to have padding to make it more uniform of 15 pixels. That would ensure that you'd have 30 pixels of space between each item. I personally like using the padding method more just because there's always going to be space between each item, no matter if it's space between items next to each other or items above and below each other. Then you don't need to worry as much about media queries. So let's do that now. Going into our feature SAS file, in the feature item, we are going to say padding. And of course we need our calculator and it's 30 pixels of padding between items. So we need to divide that by two and say 15 pixels divided by 16 to get rem. So 0.9375 rems. And I think I'm just going to add padding all around the items just because we know on tablet there's going to be two rows and then mobile, they'll be stacked one under each other. So we're not going to put this padding rule in a media query. And then also just for some additional visibility, we're going to add a little border just for testing right now. Let's see what we got. So now you can see we have our four flex items and they have a line between them and there is some padding. So they're nicely spaced. 
This looks pretty good. Since we did have the flex just for desktop, watch what happens when we get below the desktop breakpoint. They go to one column, and this is what we would want on mobile. But for tablet, we want them to be two columns. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back into our code editor, and we're going to start working with the flex property more. Now in the feature item selector, we want to add another mix-in for the tablet styles. So include breakpoint up medium. Actually, there's another thing we need to do. We need to make sure Flexbox is used on tablet as well. So we need to add that medium breakpoint, turn on display flex for that. And then I guess we can turn this off or not turn this off. We can delete that rather since we don't need to use display flex just for desktop. What this mixin is saying is that it's going to have display flex for medium widths and up. That's hence the name breakpoint dash up. So going back into our feature item selector, in the tablet styles, we need to tell each feature item to take up basically half the width, right? So instead of the desktop where it's just fitting everything into one row, and instead of the mobile styles where everything is on its own row, for tablet we want each item to take up half the row. So we can do that with the flex property. So the flex property is going to be one, zero, and then I'll say 50%. Now let me explain this. The flex property itself is actually a shorthand property and it has three different flex properties that it includes. So the first one is flex grow, the second one is flex shrink, and then the last one is flex basis. Now flex basis means the default width that the item is going to have. In our case, we want the feature item to take up half the width, so we say flex basis is 50%. Now for flex grow, what does that mean? Well, setting it to one as opposed to zero means that it's allowed to grow in order to fill the space. So that's why for the large, we set it to just flex one. And this is kind of a shorthand way of saying flex one, zero, and then I believe either auto or zero percent. But you can just say flex one to make the flex child item fit the available width with as many of the flex child items as exist. So if you want all the items to be the same width and to be on the same row, you would say flex of one. So in our case, what is happening here is that each feature item is going to take up half the width and it's going to be allowed to grow to fill up the space if it needs to, although this is not strictly necessary. So this should also work even if we said flex grow of zero. The next one is flex shrink. This basically means if the item is allowed to shrink less than the flex basis in order to fit on the row. So let's just start off with 0, 0, 50%. And I'm going to also need to turn on wrapping in Flexbox because by default, if you don't turn wrapping on, it's going to try to fit all the child items in one row. So flex wrap and set to wrap. Okay, so now I think we have the styles we need to have the tablet styles look correct. Okay, so here's the page. Let's see how it looks on tablet. Ooh, look at that. So now it's taking up 50% starting from the medium breakpoint. Then as we continue decreasing, it'll go to one column for mobile. So this general layout is pretty set now. It's kind of doing everything we want it to do in terms of the number of columns. So I think this should be all set in terms of Flexbox stuff. Now let's move on to making each of these items have the correct icon as well as the correct text. Okay, so going down here, the next one is simple budgeting. Okay, so we got our text down. Now we need to make sure the icons are correct. So the second one is simple budgeting. Let's see the file names. On images, icon, budgeting, icon budgeting, that's the name. Budgeting. Next section is fast onboarding, so icon onboarding. Then we got open API, so it's probably this one, icon API. See how it looks on the website, and we have our different icons and the text, which is great. Let's go back and style the text and also fix some of this spacing stuff here. The first thing we're going to do is we want to make sure that the intro text has the correct styles. So if we go up here, it looks like the h2 tag is going to be smaller than the hero h1 tag. So let's see, let's kind of estimate how big this text is. I'm going to say it's going to be about 37, maybe 36 pixels. Let's start adding some global text styles for the h tags. So a little descriptor there. So for h2, the font size was 36 pixels. 
divided by 16 is 2.25 rims. And I believe that's just for desktop, because if we look at the design, the y 2 Easy Bank text looks smaller on mobile, so we're going to have to add some styles for mobile as well. This is about 30. Not too much different, but, you know, different enough. 1.875 rims. 1.875 rims, and then we'll add the font size 2.25 rims in our breakpoint. Let's say just for large. So we're going to tell the tablet styles to use the, uh-oh, oh, I forgot again, breakpoint dash up. There's a little error down there. And we also need to look at the margin underneath. So what I'm kind of looking at here is the two H2 tags that we're going to need on the page, the Why Choose Easy Bank title and the latest articles title, because they look like they're the same size. And if you look at the format of the page, they should be H2 tags from an SEO standpoint. I'm going to measure the space under each of them and make sure it's the same. And if it is, then we can just add the same margin bottom. About 36. It looks like this is a little bit more. It's going to be 55. Honestly, I think that I might get a little bit away from the design and have them be the same amount of space. Let me just see how much space I put under the hero in that H1 tag. It's not a huge deal, but I just want to kind of be consistent with the spacing if I can and see what I've done already. So it looks like here the margin bottom is 1.5 rems, which is, if we look on our layout tab, 24 pixels. So for whatever reason, there's more space under the H2 tag than the H1, but that's totally fine. You know, this is just kind of how the design is. So I think I might use the 36 spacing, 36 pixel spacing for both H2 tags, and it'll just be slightly different from the design in this case. So 36 margin bottom. And since we know that the font size is also 36, we'll just say 2.25 rims. And then there's probably going to be a slightly different mobile margin bottom. Let's see what this is here. About 25. So 25 divided by 16 is 1.5625. 1.5625 1 rims. Now let's see how this is looking so far. Okay, so there's a lot of spacing. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's how it is. Now we obviously need to make sure the text looks correct as well. So it's pretty similar to the H1 styles, except that it is a different size. So let's copy some of the H1 styles over. Oh, where did I put those H1 styles? I wonder if I put it in the hero SAS file. Oh yeah, hero text H1. I'm going to move these H1 styles from the hero SAS file into the globals, just because theoretically, if there were other pages on this website, they would probably want to use the same H1 styles as we have in the hero. So let's do that. So let's open up the hero SAS file that we were working with last time and find the H1 selector. So I'm just going to copy this entire thing here. Save the hero, and then we're going to add the H1 styles up here in the globals. That way everything is the same. Now another thing we can do to make our code a little bit more efficient is we know, looking at the design, that the H1 tag and the H2 tags are using the same font weight and probably line height as well. So I'm going to copy all the styles from the H1 tag that I think are going to be reused in the H2 tag and maybe even the H3 tag into this compound selector for H1, H2, and H3 tags. So we're going to take this, color is the same. We'll leave the margin bottom there because it's different, but the text styles themselves, we can reuse them. So I think actually font size should stay just in the H1 tag. There we go. So now we know that H1, H2, and H3 tags are going to have the same look, and the only difference that they're going to have from each other is the font size and then the margin bottoms. So this kind of just makes your styles a bit more efficient. Let's go back to our site, and now we can see that the H2 tag does have the same general look. It's obviously a bit smaller. Okay, going back to our design. Let's see what else we need to do. Let's check out the body copy styles. And again, it looks like we can reuse some of the styles that we did last time, where the body copy looks the same as in the hero section itself. So let's see where those styles came from and where I saved them. So again, it's hero text P. Line height, 1.5, margin bottom is set. So the font size itself comes from the body selector, which is good. It's the default font size. So what I think I can do is maybe assume again that the paragraph used in the hero is probably going to be similar styles to paragraphs used elsewhere in the site. So I'm going to copy those styles over as well into our globals. So we'll put this here under the headline tag styles. 
and I'll save the hero one as well and check back on the site. Looks pretty similar. I'm actually not sure if it looked different from before, but that's okay. Now let's see what we have, compare it back to the design and see what differences there might be. Now one thing I've noticed immediately is that the text, the paragraph text in this section doesn't go all the way across, it ends. Whereas right now it's going all the way across. So I need to figure out how wide the paragraph is going to take and how I want to style that. So what I could do is I could add maybe a max width of this intro section. Uh, it looks like it's going a little bit more than half because we can assume that the halfway mark of the page is down here. And another trick that I use sometimes is you click on the artboard in Adobe XD and you go down here to the grid layout, the grid section, and if you check this box, it's going to superimpose columns. And this is really handy for designers especially, but it's also handy for developers because you can count how many columns need to be for each section. And I think this should be, yes, a 12 column layout. And of course, like this is superimposed on a JPEG of the actual design. So I may have to mess with this a little bit, but I'm really just using this to see where the halfway point is. So the halfway point is this white stripe right down there. And so it looks like the paragraph is actually going beyond that halfway mark, but it doesn't seem to align with anything else. What I might do is simply set this intro section to be 50% width or maybe 55 or 60%. Let's go back into our index.html and go into the intro section. And I just kind of put the h2 and paragraph tags as direct children of the section tag. So what I might do here is create a child div. So class of feature, maybe intro. Oops, I'm running CSS styles. Intro and then press enter. It's kind of hard to fight with uh, muscle memory. Okay, there we go. So now we have a feature intro, this new selector that we're going to add into our features SAS file. So I usually try to order my selectors in the same order as they exist in the HTML markup. The feature intro comes before the feature grid, so we'll add it above the feature grid. So feature intro. And I'm assuming that the 55% width is only going to be for desktop and for mobile it needs to go all the way across. So we'll add the break point up large. And we'll say width of 55%. And in this case for tablet, it'll go all the way across, but I think that's okay. We can always tweak it later with a medium breakpoint if we need to. But let's load the site and see how that looks. Nice. Let's see exactly how long, how far across that 55% goes. So it goes about here, kind of close to the design, right? We can also look at where the line break is. So the line break here is at financial hub. Financial hub's on the second line, so we could just maybe increase the percentage. So financial hub fits. So it looks like 60% might be more accurate. So we'll change this width property to 60%. All right, hey, we're doing pretty good here. Now the next thing we want to do, now that we've styled the intro section, is style the cards. First thing I'm going to look at is how much spacing there is between the intro and the cards themselves. Okay, so there's quite a bit of space between the intro and the cards themselves. Now, keeping in mind that we did add that padding, I'm just gonna leave a little extra space to kind of take up the space that the padding I added. So it looks like it's about maybe 60 pixels tall. Where do we wanna add the spacing? Let's go back to our site and check it out. We could add it in the paragraph, but let's say the client wanted to add another paragraph tag or multiple paragraphs into this section Obviously this is a hypothetical client since this is just a demo website, but this is kind of what happens in the real world. You know, you wanna try to write your styles in a way that is future-proof as much as possible. So you need to consider, you know, what happens if they wanna add more copy or less copy or, you know, more feature items or less feature items. All these things could change in the future because, you know, these websites are supposed to be representations of real companies and things like that. In terms of the spacing, I'm probably going to add padding, bottom padding, to the feature intro section, or maybe margin bottom, to add space between that and the grid. So it looks like there's some space already from the paragraph tag, but we'll add some margin bottom to feature intro. Going to the feature intro, the margin bottom, and I think I said it was 60 pixels, so divided by 16, 3.75 rems. So margin bottom, 3.75 rems. See how that looks. All right, so now there's more spacing, which is awesome. And the interesting thing, I don't know if you notice this, but you can see in the developer tools, the margin bottom is highlighted in yellow, and that's the 60 pixels. You can see that the paragraph also has a margin bottom. 
even though there's margin bottom in both the paragraph and the feature intro, they don't combine together and like add to be, you know, whatever, 2.25 rems plus 3.75 rems. So I think we can consider this intro section actually done. One thing I want to check really quickly is the mobile styles for that. Looks like it is 36 pixels for mobile between the intro and the grid. Okay, it's less, it's actually the same. Okay, so it's still about 60 pixels of space between intro and grid. So what I'm going to do is move that margin bottom property into the default styles, which are the mobile styles in our case. So now if we look at the site, it is the same amount of space at the bottom, 60 pixels, no matter what your viewport is. All right, the next thing we want to do is we want to style these feature cards. So going back to the design, we can see that the icons have some space under them, and we need to also style the text as well. So let's start with the icon spacing. And the space between the icon and the text is about 44 pixels. Let's go into our code and the feature underscore underscore icon is where we're going to be adding this style rule. And we want to say margin bottom 44 divided by 16 is 2.75 rems. So now we got our space. And I also want to make sure the spacing is the same, or see if the spacing is the same. So it looks like there's a bit less spacing for mobile. Let's say 30 pixels for mobile. So again, we will add the default styles for mobile. 30 divided by 16 is 1.875. And then we'll add the 2.75 rems in our, in our breakpoint up large media query. There we go. Okay, so we got our spacing. Cool. Let me also double check and see if the icon image is the same or different. It looks like they're the same. Let's double check that to be sure. About 74 and same for desktop. So I think we are good with this. They're staying the same between mobile and desktop. Let me actually add some spacing so that this can kind of scroll up more so I'm not blocking it with the image of myself. I'm just going to add some a min height to our body selector. Add to the bottom here, we'll say min height is maybe 200 viewport height. See if that helps in terms of the scrolling. Yeah, so now I can scroll down a little bit. Just a tiny bit more, 300. <laughs> now I can position it in the kind of a better place on the screen for all of you. Now let's do the feature block title. Looks like the font styles are similar to our headline font styles. Obviously, it's a much smaller font size. Let's say about 24 pixels. Now, going back to our code, it was feature underscore underscore title. So in our feature SAS file, we'll say, actually, let's check the mobile styles first. It was about 24 pixels big for the desktop, and it looks a bit smaller for mobile. It's more like 20. So 20 for mobile, 24 for desktop. So font size, 20, it's 1.25 rems. And then we'll add our mix in for the breakpoint up. Large font size is 24 divided by 16 is 1.5 rems. And we need to copy the headline styles that we had used from the globals. So I'm just going to copy font weight 300, 1.15, color dark blue. And we'll add them over there. For text styles, I sort of follow this order. I do font size first, then font weight, then line height, then color. Sometimes I'll do line height under font size because they're sort of related. Let's check out our styles. All right, looks pretty good. Now let's add the space under the feature title. So for desktop, it's about 36, maybe 34. And for mobile, it is a little bit smaller again, 26. So let's say 24 and 34. This is going to be the feature title selector. We'll add a margin bottom property. 24, 1.5 rems. And then the margin bottom for large was 34 divided by 16, 2.125. And checking back on the site, looks good. Next thing is to style the paragraph, the feature description styles. So it looks like on mobile, 15, let's say 16, just because. And then for desktop, looks like it might be the same actually for desktop and mobile. 
Yeah, I think they're actually the same. So 16 pixels for both. And this is for the feature description. So font size. And I know that 16 pixels is one rem, so one rem. It looks like we need more line height because there's not enough spacing between the lines. Line height, let's say 1.5 perhaps to start. Font looks a little smaller on the design than in the website. Maybe 14 pixels instead of 16. Does that seem a little closer? I think that's closer. <laughs> so we'll do 14 pixels and then 1.5 line height. So 14 divided by 16 is 0 0.875 rems. And then line height, 1.5. There we go. Okay, looks good. I think maybe we can take away the that magenta border that we'd added. And then this should look pretty close to how it should look on the design. Okay, one thing that I think I forgot is I need to add that gray background to this section. Okay, let's see what color is this in our variables. So the very light gray was the hero background. Maybe the light grayish blue. Let's see if that's correct. So I'm going to add it to the, let's see. I want to add it into the features section. I honestly might just rename this to be feature singular so it matches, you know, the feature underscore underscore classes as well. Background color. And we'll paste in the light grayish blue. Does that seem right? That seems pretty close. Now, of course, we need to add some more spacing here because, yeah, it's not quite enough. Looks like it's about 110 on top and then a little bit less on the bottom, 90 on the bottom. Let me go double check what I'd added to that container class that we'd created last time. So I think I said, here we go, padding top 2.25 rems times 16 to get the pixels, 36 pixels. So this is much more spacing for this section. I wonder if I just hadn't added enough, yeah, padding to this. I might just try to keep them all the same, around 90 or so. And then I'll add more for this top thing here. I wonder why I had added only 36 pixels of padding. I wonder if that's because of the mobile style that I was looking at. So I think what I'm gonna do is just increase the padding basically all around for that container class. So we'll do 70 for mobile, we'll do 96 for desktop, and then we'll see if this breaks anything. We're doing 70 for mobile, so padding top and bottom should be 4.375 rems. And we want that to be the same on the bottom as well. And for now we'll leave the padding left and right. Yeah, so we'll just, any, any case that we had padding top and bottom, we're going to increase it to 4.375 rems for mobile. And then for desktop, so include breakpoint up large. I'm going to say padding top. And that was 96, I think I said. So 96 divided by 16, six rems. This will be for both padding top and padding bottom. This one just has padding top, so we'll delete that. And this just has padding bottom, so we'll delete the padding top. Okay, so we'll, for now we'll leave padding left and padding right. Check out our website, see if things look better and if I broke anything. So you can see there is more spacing here. Um, it's good, 70 on top and bottom. Looks decent enough. Let's go to desktop. But in terms of spacing the container, the nav looks okay, which is good. And then here, we need to make sure that this goes all the way across. But the top and bottom padding that looks pretty good. So let's fix this thing here. Um, basically, I need to make the container PALL a child of the section itself so that it doesn't get limited in width. So I'm going to create a new div, call it feature content perhaps. And then I'm going to move all the HTML into this child div. Then I will move the container out of here and into the feature content. And this will ensure that the feature section itself will have that light gray background and it won't be limited in terms of width. It'll go all the way to the left and to the right. You can see that's happening. And then in the feature content, that's where you get your max width set for the content inside the light gray. So this looks pretty good. Go to the design and do just an eyeball and see if anything looks off or if this looks pretty close. And this looks pretty close. I'm pretty happy with that. 
I think there might be a little too much spacing under here, under the feature title. Yeah, that's too much. So it should be about 32 or so. How much space do we actually have here? 34. I think I need to just decrease this a little bit. So let's say margin bottom, 30 pixels. Margin bottom, 30 pixels. Still looks like a little bit too much spacing. Yeah, that's a lot less, even though this is this does seem correct. Sometimes it's just added spacing from the the text afterwards. You can see here, there's a tiny little bit of spacing until the text starts. So this is probably what I need to account for. So let's try maybe down to 20 even. Maybe even a tiny bit more, 22. Maybe 24. I think that's close enough. So we'll change the feature title margin bottom to 24 pixels. Going back to our feature SAS file, margin bottom needs to be 24. 1.5 rems and then let's check it again for mobile because that will also probably need to be decreased so it's a little bit less yeah i think i'm just gonna have to try to eyeball it again <laughs> margin bottom start with maybe 20 pixels let's try with 16 pixels we'll do 16 pixels for margin bottom on mobile and 16 pixels is one rem that looks much better. Let's go back to desktop and then compare it again to the design. Okay, spacing looks pretty good. And let's go to mobile. See how that looks. I guess we can use the emulator too. Okay, so in mobile everything is center aligned, including the icon. So let's do that. So maybe in feature, I'll say text align center for the default mobile styles and then Let's start this with medium, since it's two columns for the features for medium. So we want, we probably want those to be left aligned. Text align left. It's not centered. Um, let's check back here. Hmm, why is that rule not working? There's no error in the SAS. And I cannot see, oh wait, oh no, I did this again. Breakpoint up. Okay, now we should be good. Okay, now, yeah, text align left is showing up. So now I'm going back to mobile. That looks good. And then tablet width is around here. So this is going to be, you can see two columns, everything's left aligned. Desktop, it's four columns and everything's left aligned. All right. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Looks close to the design. Okay, so I think we can consider the feature block to be complete. All right, let's build out the latest article section. Now, per the use, before we do any actual coding, we're going to look at the design, which I have open here in Adobe XD, and let's go down to that article section. You can see that it is four columns on desktop and one column on mobile, and we'll probably do two columns for tablet. Now, if you saw the previous video where we built out this featured section just above it, it has basically the same layout. They're both four columns on desktop, one column on mobile. And I'd mentioned last time that while we were going to build the feature section using Flexbox for the article section, we're going to use CSS Grid. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to build out this four column layout using CSS Grid as opposed to Flexbox. And honestly, I think that you could use either Flexbox or Grid for both of these sections. I don't think either one of them has a super strong advantage over the other. So this is one of those cases where you can just pick whichever you are more comfortable with. All right, so now that we have looked at the design, we can just start getting all right so now that we've looked at all right now that we've looked at the design let's start getting into the code so we're going to go into vs code our code editor and if you've been following along you might notice that my color scheme are slightly different i've been trying to tweak this customization in vs code for a bit and hopefully when everything's done i will be able to release it as an actual theme so you can all download it for free um, but for now it's still a work in progress Okay, now to get started, we are going to look at the index.html and we're going to add our HTML markup. So the first thing we're going to do is similar to the other sections, we're going to add a section tag. So we'll say section and we'll give it a class of maybe articles. And I know that I ended up making the section for the feature section feature singular as opposed to plural, but I'm going to try, I think maybe a slightly different approach for the articles. Now the section tag is going to be what's going to be full width on desktop. Inside the section tag, we're going to add a child element, 
which has the container class that we've been using. And if we look at the features section again, we see there's a feature underscore underscore content with some container classes. And we're going to use those same ones down in the article section. So let's add that now. So add a div just by doing that dot for the class shortcut. And we'll say article singular underscore underscore. Let's say content. And we'll probably give it the same container, actually container dot container dash dash P A L, which is the class for padding all, meaning it'll add the padding all the way around on um, each of the four sides. Then in the article content, I think what we want to do is, um, let's see what I did for the previous thing. Okay, yes, yeah, so we're using H2 tag for the intro section, and then we'll add probably the same article grid type of thing. So we'll say class article, actually, let me look at the design. So there's actually no like intro paragraph, like the feature section. So it just has that H2. So I think I can get away with just writing H2 and then we'll copy the text over latest articles. Then under the H2, we'll add another div and we'll say article grid. And then in the article grid, that's going to be our CSS grid parent element. So then we'll add the child elements. We'll say article, I like to just say item for grid grid items, whether it's Flexbox or CSS grid. So each, each article is going to have a wrapper of article item. Now, going back to the design again, you can see that in each article item, there's an image on top, and then there is some sort of text content below that. So you can kind of break this up into two different sections. So what I'm going to do is say, in the article item, we'll say article underscore underscore image. And then below that, we'll do article underscore underscore, and maybe I'll say text. And that's going to contain all the text in the article. Now, the reason I'm going, the reason I'm wrapping all the text in one div article text is because of this padding all the way around. So if I didn't add the article text, I would have to basically add the left and right padding to each individual text element. And then I would have to add the top and bottom padding or margin, whichever one you want, um, to the first and last element. So I, I personally think in this case, it's just simpler to wrap all the text in one div element and then add a padding all the way around. There's just a little bit less coding involved. Okay, so we got the article image and when you have an image, you always have to ask yourself, do I want the to use an, and when you have an image, you always have to ask yourself, all right, do I want to use an image tag or do I want to use a background image? And one way you can sort of help figure out which approach is better is if we look at the design, let's, let's take this dollar image and maybe I'll just delete this. I don't really need that rectangle. So if we look at the dollar image, you can see that it's the same image, of course, but the cropping is a little bit different between desktop and mobile. So here it's more squarish. And if you look at the mobile, you can see that the right edge goes just out a little bit farther. It kind of cuts off on desktop right at the corner of that one bill. And the same goes for the left side. You can see that it cuts off here and it's a little bit longer on the left side as well. So that kind of tells me that I probably want to use a background image for the image element. That way you can crop it to different sizes and you're not going to, um, you know, adjust the size of the image or, or make it look kind of weird. So in that case, for the article image, there's not going to be any actual content, but I will add the background image using background image URL. And then we need to add the URL, of course, of the image. So if we go into our images folder, it's going to be one of these. It's probably going to be one of these image files here. So the first one's going to be image currency JPEG. So we'll add that in. So we'll start off with slash images and then image dash currency. And I hope that, is that right? Yeah, 
the images folder is not in the app folder, but it's in its own folder. Image, image currency dot JPEG. Okay. Then let's add the markup for the text. So if you look at the text item. There is first an author section, then there's a title of the blog post, and then there's a either a description or a summary. Um, you know, you can call this anything you want. So let's write the markup. So it's going to be author, title, and then description. So I'll say article, author, title, description. Okay, and then we'll just kind of copy those over as well. And there is an ellipsis at the end of that description just because it's a shortened blurb. So we'll just copy over that ellipsis symbol as well. Okay, now we add a space here just to kind of differentiate the item from the grid itself. There we go. Uh, there we go. And let's see, you know, there's one more thing that we probably want to do and that is when you have a grid like this, if it's for blog posts or whatever, it's usually going to be a link and there's no, you know, read more link in the design. So what I'm going to do is make the entire item a, an anchor link. Um, and that's usually, I think the preferred way of doing it, because even if you hover over the image, you'd like, you'd like to be able to click over to the blog post itself, anywhere you click on this section. So I think what I can do is article item. I'm going to make that an anchor link. And then we'll add href. And of course it's not going anywhere. So we'll just say pound. Okay. So I think we got all the markup that we need. I'm just going to do the styles just for this first article item, just to make sure everything's correct. Then once everything's been kind of set and we know that it's correct, then once we figure out all the styles for this, we can copy it for the additional uh, three items. So to start off with the styles in our SCSS folder, I'm going to create a new file. We'll call it article.scss. And of course, since we created a new SAS file, we need to import it. So we'll say import article. All right. So we should be adding the article SAS file to the watch. Now, let me scoot this over to the other side. So the first thing I want to do is remember we made the section tag have a class of articles. So I'll add some styles for that just in case we need it. Um, and then we'll add article. So we'll add content, grid, item. So I'm just, you know, I'm just copying all the classes that I created in the Nix.html file over to the SAS file. So image text, uh, oops, author, title, and description. All righty. And I may delete this if we don't end up writing any styles for it, but I think we'll be okay. All right, going back to the design, we need to figure out what the background color of this is. And it's very faint, but it seems like the blog posts themselves are white. And then this background is a very light gray. So it's probably the same as what we had in the hero section. So that's going to be a style rule for the articles section tag. So background color. And if we look in our variable SAS file, it's probably going to be this very light gray color here. So we'll do that. And then let's see how that looks. 
There we go. So here's what we got so far. We can see that because I did make the article item an anchor link, it's, it has that purple link text and it's turning into the, the hand when you hover over it. But it does look like the background color is correct. So I think that is just fine for now. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is let's get the CSS grid stuff working. So for article grid, I want to set, let's just say display grid for all widths, even mobile, um, just to just to do it that way. <laughs> Okay, now the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to start writing the styles for CSS grid. Now, even though mobile is just one column, I think I'm still gonna do display grid for mobile and then also tablet and desktop, just to see if that's you know a good way of approaching this. So we'll turn on grid with display grid. Now, unlike Flexbox, if you write display grid just by itself with no other styles, nothing is going to visibly happen. Um, and that is because for grid, you need to not only set grid, display grid, but you also need to start creating your template. This is one of the core differences between Flexbox and grid. Flexbox is more of a content first approach. So once you turn on Flexbox for the flex parent, it's going to just try to fit all the flex child items on the same row by default. For grid, you need to set up the template, meaning you need to set up the number and the size of the columns and or rows in, in the layout. So for our layout, it's a four column layout for desktop, two column tablet, one column mobile. So since mobile is just one column, we'll say grid template columns. And we just want one column. So we'll say one FR. And FR is a fractional unit. It's kind of a general ratio unit um, used for CSS grid, meaning it will take up as much space as possible and if there's more than one child item in the column or the row, it'll sort of divide the space up between those child items, depending on the number. So one of ours kind of the default, like, you know, auto kind of width. So mobile just has one column. Now let's add the grid template for tablet. So we'll use our mix in that we wrote, breakpoint dash up. And for medium widths, we're going to say grid, and you can actually, um, Abbreviate it. If you just type in GTC, it has this really cool IntelliSense and it'll automatically detect. So for tablet, we want two columns. So we're going to use the repeat function. This is super handy for grid. So repeat takes two parameters. The first one is going to be how many columns you want to use. We want two. So then you say two comma, and then again, we'll say one FR. So this will basically create a layout that has two columns and they will each be the same width, one fractional unit. Lastly, we'll do desktop styles. So breakpoint up, large. And then again, we'll say GTC. And instead of two, we'll say four. So four comma one FR. So this is just your sort of standard run of the mill grid where you have a multi-column layout um, for different and the number changes based on your device width. So let's see what this looks like right now. Okay. Oh, this is interesting. So instead of taking up the full width, you can see that this article is taking up only part of the width. And that's because we set four columns in that grid template. So if we look at article grid, I'm using Firefox and they have a really helpful tool. If you click on the layout tab and we expand grid. So it detects the, the, that this is a grid item because you know it has display grid. So if I check this box, it's actually going to create lines. It'll number the different columns and rows in the template that we made. So remember, we just created a four column layout in this grid thing. So it's showing us the four columns in the grid template. So if we added more items, it would populate this grid. So let's actually do that now. I, I'm guessing the markup's probably okay. So we'll... Take this, we'll duplicate it one, two, three times, save, and go back to our browser. So now we can see that the four columns are actually working, which is pretty cool. So let's let's see how this looks on tablet. So we'll reduce the width and it went to two columns and then one column. 
for mobile. So yeah, this is a pretty, you know, with just a few rules, we've already sort of created our grid layout, which is pretty cool. So for CSS grid, the approach that we used is a very sort of responsive design approach, meaning we're using media queries to change the grid template and change the number of columns. There are some, there is another approach that you can use with grid that is more intrinsic design, meaning you don't have to use all these media queries because there are some built-in properties that can sort of figure out and adjust how the layout actually looks depending on the width of your browser. So I'm just going to show you one of those now, and then I'll explain why I actually prefer this method with the media queries. So let us, um, let's just comment out everything except display grid. So control K, control C, we'll comment that out in VS code. And what you could do is for your grid template columns property, we can use something called um, auto fit and then also another function called min max. And I'll explain what each of those is um, once we write out this rule. So if you remembered, we, for the desktop, oh wait, I think I have an error here. Um, no, it should be okay, I think, okay. So if you look down in the desktop rule that we had previously, it said grid template columns, and then it used the repeat function. We're gonna do something similar here. So we're gonna say repeat, but instead of writing an actual number, like four or two, we're going to say auto fit. And this is a property that sort of lets grid decide how many columns are gonna actually be on the website, which is pretty cool, right? You don't have to say two or four, it'll sort of decide for you. And then for the width of each column, we're going to use min max. So instead of saying, you know, I want this column to be 200 pixels wide or one FR or two FRs, we can sort of, again, give the grid itself the basically the control over how wide things will be, as well as how many columns are gonna be on the row. So min max, as the name kind of sounds, you give it a minimum and then you give it a maximum width in the parameters. So the minimum width, we're going to say, let's go back to the design really quick. And this square, so this is about 200 pixels wide. So we'll say that for the minimum, we'll say about 200 pixels, maybe a little wider, let's say two, 230 perhaps. And usually I should convert that to rems. So let's do that. Open the calculator and 230 divided by 16 is 14.375. So 14.375 rems. And then the maximum will say one FR, right? So this will basically give the grid column either a width of, you know, 230 pixels, 14 rems minimum, or it could be all the way up to one FR. So it could theoretically take up the entire space of the row. And this is actually all you need. So let's kind of see what that does to our grid in the browser. So it looks the same on desktop. There's four items and they're all in the same row. And each item is currently 265 pixels. So that is above, that is between the min, min width of 230 pixels and obviously one FR could be 100%. Well, let's see what happens when we take the browser width and we slowly reduce it. Okay, still four. Okay, so now you can see it broke to three columns and then there's three items on one row and then one item by itself on the second row. We'll just kind of keep going here. So now it's broken to two columns. And then for mobile, it is one column. And this is actually really, this is one of the, I think, this is one of the great parts of grid where with simply one rule in the in the grid parent, grid template columns using repeat, auto fit, and min max, it created this one column, two column, three column, up to four column layout. So, you know, this is pretty cool. Now, you know, why did I mention that I'm not going to use this approach? Well, even though it is awesome that we can write this rule and create a multi-column layout without using any media queries, I know that in real life, um, if the design has four items and they want it in one row for desktop, 
they may not be super happy when you have a layout like this where it looks uneven. And let me show you, let me kind of highlight that by hiding the grid lines. So we'll just pretend that there's lines around each of them. Let's do that. Uh, article item, border, one pixel, solid, red. So around each of these items now is the, the, the um, so around each of these items, there's a line now. So, you know, this looks a bit uneven, right? <clears throat> so this looks a little bit uneven. I think most people, if they want to show four items, they're not going to want it to look like this. You know, it looks better when it's even and there's just two, two and two. And of course it's fine when it's on mobile and it's just one column, but this in-between state is not really desirable, I would say. Um, and unfortunately, that's just kind of the way, that's kind of what happens when you let grid control, you know, the number of columns using auto fit and then the width using the min max function. So even though there's more rules for the sake of, you know, kind of maintaining control over that grid, I'm going to go back to the media query thing. Um, and for auto fit, I don't know if I explained that fully, but we go back to turning on the grid lines and then turning off the border. So for auto fit, what happens is it will fit the items as well as it can in the template. And the, the other option instead of auto fit is you could say auto fill and they're very similar, but not quite the same. Let's see if we can see the difference here. Doesn't seem to be different for us, but let me just show you. Um, there's a really good article on CSS tricks for auto fit, auto fill. Okay, yeah, Sarah Suiden. Um, she wrote this great article comparing what auto fit and auto fill look like. Um, so in this example, you can see auto fill will create the template, um, but it's not going actually all the way across. Whereas auto fit will kind of try to fit the content to the row. And then if you go down a little bit more, I believe there's an animated example here. So if you look at this, the top one's auto fill. So you can see there's actually a blank column when you keep extending it out. Whereas auto fit will, you know, fit the existing content to the row. So that's one difference between auto fill and auto fit. Um, again, you know, maybe it's, you know, not, maybe it's best practice to use this kind of, yeah. So that's auto fill and auto fit. Um, Again, going back to our own website, <laughs> I'm going to go back to the media queries just because I like having that extra layer of control. But this is also an option and it can definitely come in handy um, in, in other circumstances. Let's go back and we will delete this. And then we will uncomment. Control K, Control U. There we go. We'll save, go back to our site, and we're back here. There we go. Browser's a little slow sometimes. So two columns on tablet and one column on mobile. And then it goes back to four columns for desktop. So if that helps just kind of explaining sort of the basic, this is a fairly basic CSS grid layout um, using the grid template columns property. And then you can designate how many columns you want with the repeat function and then also how, um, what size each of the columns are. Let's get started now actually styling the content in the articles themselves. All right, now let's start styling the cards themselves. So we'll probably start with the image up here and then we'll move on to the text elements. So using our little rectangle here, you can see that it's about 200 pixels tall. So let's go into our code editor and add those styles in. So this is going to be for the article image element. So down here, article image, we'll say height of 200 pixels. And we do need to use our calculator for that. So 
200 divided by 16 is 12.5 rems. And then since these are also background images, let's add some of those background properties. So background size cover. So this will ensure that it will take up the entire div. Then background repeat, and I pretty much always turn repeat off. And then the other one light, and then background position, center, center, to make sure it's centered. I think those should be good for now. So let's check the site and see how that looks. Sweet, so the images are loading up. Um, looks like we forgot to add a gap in our grid parent property, so let's do that. So if we go back up to the article grid, we'll add a gap of maybe 20 pixels and 20 divided by 16 and 1.25 rems. So that looks pretty good. Um, let's actually compare that with the design. I think the gap might be a little bit more than that. So it's more like 30 pixels. So 30 divided by 16 is 1.875. Okay. And I don't know if you noticed, but down here in the uh, terminal, for some reason, it always throws an error when you start adding the gap property. I think there's just maybe a bug in the live SAS extension, but if we rewatch it, then everything's fine and there's no errors. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Um, let's see, what else do we need to do here? Did I do the background? I think I did do the background for the whole section. Um, let's just turn off the lines for now. Um, okay, so after the image, we have the text here, and I'm going to make that a white background color since you can see in the design, this is what the text area has. So let's do that, and let's also add some padding. So let's see here. Looks like it's about 30. So let's see if it's the same on the bottom. Looks like it's a bit less on the bottom, but I might just make it 30 all the way around. And let's see what the horizontal padding is. Looks like it's less. It's about 25 on the sides and then 30 on top and bottom. And let's see what we got on mobile as well. Looks like it might be a little bit more on mobile. So the side padding on mobile is 30, I guess around 30. And then let's see what the uh, bottom padding is. 44 on the bottom. And then it looks like it's less on the top. 30. So it looks like for, I might just make them all the same. 30 all the way around. Well, I guess on mobile it should have a little bit more space on the bottom. Let's see if it's the same. Yeah, it looks like all these have much bigger bottom padding. So it's fine, we'll do maybe 40. So 40 on the bottom and then the other sides will be 30 for mobile. And then on desktop, I believe it was 30 on top and bottom and then 25 on the sides, is that right? Yeah, around 30 for the top and then 20, yeah, we'll do 25, okay. This is going to be the article item element. We'll do the mobile padding first. So padding, oh, caps lock, padding. So it's going to be 30 divided by 16 and 1.875 rems. And then we'll do the same thing for everything except the bottom. So then the bottom is going to be, I think, did I say 40 rem or 40 pixels? 2.5 rems. There we go. Then we're going to do for, I guess, tablet, medium, and desktop. We'll say padding, and I think we said 30 on top and bottom, and then 25 on the sides. 25 divided by 16, 1.5625. There we go. Okay, let's see what we got. Um, oh, 
I know why the padding shouldn't be on the article item. It should be on the article text. So just for the text, that's okay. Let's fix that. Move the padding down there. There we go. That's much better. Okay. We also need to add a background color to the article text color. And I think white I made a variable for that. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So, I mean, it's a little hard to see since it's a very light gray in the background, but that is what the styles are. And I believe there's also a border radius around the whole card. So you can see the, the corners are slightly rounded all the way around. So let's add a border radius. Um, it doesn't look like it's very round. So I might do something like five pixels. So five divided by 16.3125. And we'll just do it all the way around. And one thing you need to keep in mind with border radius is that sometimes in order for the border radius to actually show up and sort of cut those corners, you need to add over, um, overflow. Yeah. Overflow hidden. So that'll make sure that the actual rounded corners will show up. Cool. That looks pretty good. Okay. So let's do the text starting from the top, just working our way down. So the first part of this card text is the author section. And this looks like it's quite small. I'm going to say, yeah, it's probably around 10, I would say 10 pixels tall. So let's do that. So here we go. Author font size. It's going to be 10 divided by 16, 0 0.625. I'm assuming it's going to be the same for both mobile and uh, tablet and desktop. Now let's move on to the title. And it looks like it's a darker gray and it is bigger. So about maybe 17 or 16. Let's do 17. So font size, 17 divided by 16. 1.0625. And then for the description, looks like it's bigger than 10 pixels since it's bigger than the author, but not too much. It's about 13. That's a bit small. 13 divided by 16 is 0 0.8125 rems. Okay. Now let's see how that looks. Looks pretty good. Now, of course, we do need to do the colors right now. Since I made the whole article item an anchor tag, it has that purple link color. So we'll adjust those. But size wise, that looks fairly good. We might need to tweak the uh, line height a little bit. But let's do those font colors. So it looks like the author and the description are the regular gray that, you know, we saw kind of up here. Then the title is the same darker gray as the title up there. Let's do that. So since we have both author and description, the same color, what I might do to make it slightly more efficient is in the article text, I'm going to add the color property there. And then I will make the different darker gray color for just the article title. So if we go into our variables, that sort of medium gray is probably this grayish blue. And then the darker gray is probably this dark blue color or the title. There we go. Okay. Okay. Looking much closer. So let's now work with the spacing. So we need to add some space between the elements and then we'll also adjust the line height on that title. Looks like it's a little bit too much, but first spacing. Okay. Below the author is 16 pixels of spacing. That's one rem. So we'll add a margin bottom of one rem to the author. Then to the title, there's some space under that as well. Um, looks like it's a bit less, but honestly, I'm just going to say 16 as well. Maybe I'm being lazy. And then let's see what else we need to do. We need to adjust the line height of the title and also we'll check the line height of the description as well. 
So right now, it seems like there's a little too much line height right here. So let's try something like line height. And I usually like to put the line height property under the font size property since they're kind of related. So 1.15 maybe? And I'm just kind of guessing here. One, a line height of one means it's the same as the font size. 1.15 means it's just, just a little bit taller than what the font size is. Okay, so that looks closer, which is good. Um, that seems pretty good. Maybe just a tiny little bit more. So maybe 1.2. So 1.2. Okay. I think that's fairly close enough. So let's check out the line height for the description now. I think that's actually pretty close. Yeah, I think that's good enough. And it looks like the spacing that we have between the elements is okay as well. I feel like there's a bit less spacing here, so maybe we should make that a little bit smaller. So article title, go to the rules tab, and right now, I think I had set a margin bottom of 16 pixels or one rem. So let's adjust this. So 16 pixels is a little too big. So let's try 14. Looks a much closer on the design, so maybe 10 pixels. Looks like it might be less than that, actually. Maybe eight pixels. Okay, let's do eight. I feel like there's less spacing under the author as well. Let's just copy this over first. Margin bottom of eight pixels. Article title. Eight divided by 16 is 0.5 rems. I guess I could have done the math because 16 divided by 2 is 8. Anyway, and the author, what happens if we just do the same thing? 0.5 rems. It does look a bit better, I think. There's still a little bit more space under the author, so we'll, we'll just tweak that a bit. So instead of 8 pixels, let's say 10, maybe 12. 12 pixels. Um, 12 divided by 16, 0.75 rems. Okay, so I think that looks all right. Okay, so I think our text is pretty good actually. <laughs> so now let's add the proper images and copy for each of these articles. So in our index.html file, we will adjust that. Just copy these all over. I guess we can just cut it since we're not, don't really need to keep it. This is already there. Okay, so let's do the images. So in the design, it's the currency, then it's like a restaurant, then a plane with clouds, and then confetti. So restaurant, plane, confetti. If we look on our images folder, image, restaurant. Oh, I had the name right. 
restaurant, and the second one was plain, and then confetti. All right, let's see how this looks. Hey, it looks pretty good. So if we take it down, it comes two columns, and then one column on mobile. This is pretty good. Not too shabby. So one extra thing that I'm going to add is some nice little hover states. And I think I'm also going to add a box shadow just to make the card a little more separate from the background. So let's add those in now. So the box shadow, I'm going to add to the article item itself since I want it to go kind of all the way around. So article item, we'll say box shadow. And for box shadow, it takes a bunch of different parameters. So let me just type them in first and then explain what they are. Okay, so in box shadow, the first two numbers are the position of the shadow. So the first zero pixels will control the horizontal position. So I want it to be probably in the center, so I'll leave that as zero pixels. The second zero pixels is the vertical position. And usually for shadows, it's better to make it a little bit down from the object itself, so it seems more like a real shadow. So we'll maybe adjust that to be three pixels. And I'll convert these to rems once we've kind of finalized everything. And the last number parameter is the spread. So it's kind of how diffuse versus how like hard line of the shadow it is. So I tend to do at least 10 pixels, maybe 12 pixels for the spread. And we can of course tweak that as we see fit. And then the last one is the color of the shadow. And for shadows, I usually like to use a semi-transparent um, shadow. So what I'm, I've done is use RGBA 000, which means black. And then the last, um, last number here is the alpha channel, meaning the opacity. And I've set that to 0.15, which means basically 15% opacity. So it's, it's pretty semi, it's pretty transparent. Um, okay, so let's see how this looks. Ooh, there we go. So we got a nice shadow here. Okay, it looks like we have some issues down here where the white doesn't go all the way down to the bottom. So I think we need to figure that out. Um, so let's see what's going on here. Article item goes all the way down there. Article image and then article text. So it seems like because the text on the first two is shorter, then the last two, because you can see there's only four lines for the first two in the description, but there's five lines for the description for the last two. That's why they're taller. So one thing I could do to fix that is maybe set the background color of article item. White. So now it's like that. So let me try moving the background color to the article item instead of the article text. See if that fixes the issue. Um, we'll do it here. Okay, much better. Good. Let's make sure everything looks okay even when we're changing the width. Okay. All right. Good. Now the next thing we want to do is, I'm actually going to add a little hover state. So it just looks nice, you know, when the, there are these little, I guess you can call micro interactions. So the website kind of responds to the different actions you take. So I want this to change in some way when I hover over each card. And one thing I do a lot is scale it up slightly when you hover over it. So let's try adding that. And we'll do that to the entire article item as well. So we'll add the hover selector. And on hover, we want to transform. And we'll increase the size by using scale. And then in the scale function, we can set what we want it to scale to. Scale of 1 means 100%, so it won't change at all. So we want it to be slightly more than 100%, but not too much. So maybe 1.05. So that would be 105%. So we're only increasing by 5%. So let's try that and see how that looks. Okay, so it is just a bit larger. And we also need to add a transition so it's a bit smoother as well. 
So transition, we'll just say all, um, maybe 150 milliseconds, and then ease in out. That controls this, the smoothness and the speed of the animation. So let's try this now. Ooh, smooth like butter. I like that. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. So I think we can actually consider this section done. It looks good on mobile. Obviously on actual mobile, there's no real hover state, but that's fine. Tablet, two columns, desktop, four columns. So yeah, I think that looks pretty good. All right, so I think, all right, so I think we can consider this section complete. Before we get into actually building the footer, I wanted to point out a mistake that I'd made in a previous video that I just now noticed. And the issue that some of you may have noticed already is that there's horizontal scroll bars appearing. And this is caused because the hero content, the images that we had sort of made offset, have forced the container to be wider than the viewport width. And that's what is causing these horizontal scroll bars to display all the content. So the way to fix that is in our code, if we go down in our global SAS file to the body selector, we can add overflow X hidden. So what this is gonna do is it's going to trim or cut off any extra content outside the viewport width. So now when we go back to the website, there's no more horizontal scroll bars, which is good, but we can still scroll vertically because we only did overflow X hidden, not overflow hidden, which would cut off um, anything extra and prevent you from scrolling vertically or horizontally. So this is one way to fix issues when you do things like I did, like moving things kind of offset from the viewport, or if you have an off canvas menu, you might need to add um, overflow hidden to some of the properties. So I hope this helps any of you who may have noticed this if you're coding along with me. And let's get back now to the rest of our website. All right, so first things first, let's check out our design. So we have here the mobile design and then the desktop design open in Adobe XD. Let's take a bit closer look at the mobile version first. So in the mobile version, we have all the content stacked to one column. It looks like everything's also centered. And the different parts of the footer are the EasyBank logo. We have some social media icon links. Then we have some text links, a CTA button, and then at the bottom, the copyright info. For the desktop version, if we go over to that, it has the same content. However, instead of just being in one column, the content is split out into four columns. So the first column is going to have a logo and social media. Then we have two columns of the text links and the last column all the way on the right is the CTA button and the copyright info. All right, so now how are we actually gonna build out this footer? Um, well, as in most things, we can use multiple different approaches. We could use Flexbox if we wanted to. I think that would be a perfectly fine solution to build out the footer. I think I'm gonna use CSS Grid. And the reason for that is I want to show you all different ways that you can use, you know, Flexbox, CSS Grid to do layouts. And we did use Grid last time with the article section, but for the footer, I'm going to try to use a feature of CSS Grid called Grid Template Areas. And it's a really cool feature. It is a little weird with the syntax until you get used to it, but I promise it'll end up being more intuitive as you get along into it. So how Grid Template Areas works is you still sort of designate the template, meaning the rows and columns, in your grid layout, but you can use named areas for each of the different areas in your layout. And you can use those names to assign where in the grid you want those areas to take up. But first, let's just get the basic styles in place. And I'm actually not even gonna use CSS grid for the mobile design because everything is simply stacked in one column and then centered. Then when we do the desktop design, we will use CSS grid as well as the grid template areas. But the first thing we wanna do is we want to create our HTML markup. So I do want to keep in mind what I eventually want to be building for the desktop version. So for example, I can't just have, you know, individual social media icons or individual text links just in the footer tag itself. I'm probably gonna have to group them together so we can lay out them a bit more easily when we do use grid later on. So for example, um, I would probably have to group the logo or I would have to group these social media icons together in one div. Same thing with these text links. I might group them into two different groups. And then at the end, I could group the CTA button with the copyright info. We'll see more as we get into it, but we're just sort of keeping that in mind as we're building out the layout, even though we don't have to use grid for mobile. Let's go into our code editor, VS Code, 
and in our index.html file, I'm going to start creating the markup. Okay, so I'm going to put everything in a footer tag. So footer. And I also need to create actually a new SAS file. So let's go into our app folder, SCSS subfolder, and we'll create a new SAS file called underscore footer.scss. So that's open. And then of course, since we create a new SAS file, we need to add it in the main SAS file. So import footer, save that. And looks like, yeah, our live SAS is working. So we'll just close this up. And then I'm gonna just move the footer over to the right side so we can see both index.html as well as our styles. So in our footer tag, we're going to start adding the different content that we need. So the first thing was the logo. So the logo is usually gonna be a link. So I'll say anchor link. I'm just gonna make the href a pound. And in the link, it's actually an image because it's just loading that logo image. So we'll add the image tag and we'll say source is images and let's see it's a logo probably this logo svg so that's going to be the logo and i guess we'll give it we'll start giving things a class as well um so first thing i'm going to do is give the footer tag a class of footer i know that seems kind of redundant but in our sas file over here it makes it easier to sort of follow the bem or block element modifier approach because the class of footer will be sort of the root and then everything else comes from that. So for example, for the logo, we're gonna give it a class of footer underscore underscore logo. So then the same thing in the SAS file, will follow that pattern underscore underscore logo. And the ampersand again, just means that it inherits the root, which is footer. Okay, so let's go on to the next section. So under the footer was, I believe some social media links. So we'll create a div called footer. I'll just say social. So in this div, we need to add all of our social media links. So since they're links, so again, we'll add some more link elements. And I'll just again do a pound for the href since there's they don't actually exist. And then again, each link is going to be, I believe, an image. So image. And the source should also be in the images folder. And Let's see which one was first. So in our design, so it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram. So Facebook's first. So images, images, and it looks like icon Facebook. And then we'll give it an alt of Facebook. So then we'll do the same thing for the other links. And I think there were six total. Yeah, it's so the five. So we'll just duplicate this by selecting it and then pressing Control D. So there's five. So I think the second one was YouTube and then Twitter. So YouTube, I'm guessing it's just called, yeah, YouTube. Then Twitter, and then change the alt. And I think Pinterest was the next one. And the last one was <laughs> Instagram. There we go. So we got the social links and then let's, let's kind of look back at the design. So after the social links were the text links. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to create two groups of text links. So let's say footer links and then we'll add maybe another helper class and we'll just say uh link maybe column one there we go and then we'll add our links oops a link and the links was the text here so we'll just copy this over i think it was three per group And then we'll duplicate this. So this will be footer links column two. And we'll just replace the text. Okay. 
I found his contact blog, career support privacy policy. Let's just double check and make sure. Yep, that looks right. Okay, and then last one is going to be the CTA, and I'm going to create one group to enclose the CTA as well as the copyright. So I'll say footer. I'll just say CTA, even though the copyright's in there too. And then the first thing will be the button. So I'll say a class of button. And then the text was request invite. And this is basically the same button that we've had um, earlier in the web website. And below that is going to be the copyright info. And I'm, I'm going to make a separate div for that. So footer copyright. Um, easy bank all rights reserved. I may have deleted that somehow. So I think the symbol is copy. Easy bank all rights reserved. Okay, so now we have our markup and let's create the corresponding styles in our SAS file. And we're just going to kind of build out the skeleton. So we got footer logo. So the next thing is footer social. And in the social, we do have some links and images. We'll just leave it like this for now and we'll add it as we need. So the next thing is going to be footer links. And then footer links column one and column two. So I'll just add those as well. Okay, then after that is footer CTA. And then button. We might need a button, so I'll just say a button. And then the last thing is going to be the footer copyright. Okay, so I'll save that. Okay, looks good. So we're not going to have too much on our website, but let's just kind of see what we have here. Okay, so we have a logo loading. This may actually be a problem because this is the logo that we used up top with the sort of dark color. But this is, I believe, yeah, so the footer has this dark blue color in the background. Let's just add that now. So we're going to have to, I think, modify the SVG. And I think we should be able to edit it. We'll create a new SVG for the dark, um, for the white on dark. And then we should be able to edit that manually. So footer, we'll give it that background color of that dark blue. And it should be in the variable status file. So yeah, dark blue. And then I'll just say color white, just to sort of give it a default. Um, and maybe actually, since everything is a link, we also want to say a color white, just to make sure that all the text links will get that white color. Okay, so let's see what we got now. Yeah, so you can see with that logo, it is not visible. So let's make the new SVG file, because I think we only had that one logo image. Yeah, just that one logo. So we open the SVG, it's actually just like text, just so you can... Um... Cool thing about SVG is that you can edit colors. So you can see here these different colors. This is probably the colors of the symbol in the back. Um, so the, you know, the sort of diagonal stripes, but we need to edit the text and I'm guessing it's this thing, path fill. Um, and this is just the letters of easy bank, I'm guessing. So let's create a copy of this logo SVG file and then I'm going to rename it. Rename logo, let's say dash dark because we're going to use that on a dark background. So alt Z to wrap the words. And I believe this is the path fill and that we want to change that to white. So we'll say F and we can't use SAS variables in here because it's just, it's an SVG. Um, it is not, it can't use SAS stuff. Okay. So we'll change to logo dark in our index.html file. Um, logo dark. Let's see if that worked. Hey, there we go. And let's just double check that that does seem right. Yeah, that seems right. It's just white. 
Okay, let's add some padding to this so it looks a bit better. And I'm actually going to just turn on the responsive mode so we can see what it actually looks like. So we want to add some padding on all the sides and we also want to center the text, all the content. So let's see how much padding we need. So using my little rectangle that I created, it's going to kind of estimate it's about maybe 40 pixels on top and I'm guessing on bottom. Um, so about 40. Yeah, that's close enough. And then maybe we'll just do 40 all the way around. Nothing actually, nothing is actually reaching out to that far, but I think, you know, we'll just keep it at 40 just to have some padding all the way around. Okay, so in the footer itself, we'll say padding and 40. 40 divided by 16, 2.5 rems. And again, that's because um, to get from pixels to rems, you divide it by 16, which is the base font size by default. And, it's, and rems are just a more accessible way that you can size things because it gives the user control if they change the zoom in their browser or even modify the base font size in their browser. If you have measurements in rems, it'll sort of scale up or scale down with the browser. As opposed to pixels, it would stay pixels no matter what. So it's just better to use rems um, as opposed to pixels. You can also use EMs, um, but I like rems. Okay, so now with the padding, let's see what we got. Okay, it's good padding and text align center. Looks good. Now we need to start adding spacing. So I just kind of go from top to bottom. So I want to add spacing under the logo and on down. And again, I'm just kind of estimating here. So it's about, let's say 30 and then under the social. Okay. So we'll give 30 pixels of space under the logo, also under the social. And then I'm assuming under the text links. A little bit less, but we'll just say 30 for everything. Just makes it easier. Okay, so one add footer logo. We'll say margin bottom. And we'll say 30. So 30 divided by 16, 1.875 rems. And I guess we'll just add that margin bottom to all the elements that wanted them. So footer social, I believe, needs it. And then only the second footer link, so footer links column two, will have margin bottom as well. And then I think under the button, so in footer CTA, under the button, we'll add margin bottom. There we go. Okay. Um, margin is not taking under the logo. Why is that? It's there. Um, maybe it needs to be display block. Or, oops, don't want to do it for footer A. Footer logo. <laughs> this footer A is every single link, which is like pretty much everything in the footer. So display block. And the reason this worked is because before display block, the element I'm assuming, yeah, anchor elements are display inline by default, which means that they just kind of display however the default flow would be. And you can't add things like margin and stuff. It just won't take effect. So you can say display block. Um, or display inline block. Display block, it'll take up 100% of the width that it can. If I do display inline block, it will only take up the width of the actual content. So maybe display inline block would be better for this. So footer logo, display inline block. Okay, looks good. So it looks like they were. The margin did work for the other elements because those are divs and divs by nature, they are by default display block elements. Now we need to add some space between the social icons as well. Let's see how much space there is. Mm, 15 or maybe 16. So I'll add one rem of space using margin, margin right. So, okay. So footer social, which is this section here. And then I'm going to add the space to the anchor links. 
So again, we probably need to do display block so the margin actually like takes effect. So display inline block actually. Um, Cause display block can make them all 100% width, which is not what we want. We want them next to each other. Display inline block margin, right, one rem. Oh, and I don't want to do it for the last one. So I think I could use the not last child. So if it's not the last child, it'll have this margin right. Okay, and that looks like it worked. Let's just double check. So margin, and then they all have margin. And then the last one does not have margin, which is great. But I think I do want display inline block for all of them. So we'll just do this. Okay, cool. Now the next thing for the text links, the text links are... They are each on their own row. Oh, what I could do is I could create, make footer social a flex parent. Let's, let's try that. So display flex, and then I do need to set flex direction to be columns so that they'll be one under the other instead of trying to fit them all in the same row. So flex direction column. Oh, not for social. I want that for uh, the links. There we go. Okay, so now they're very nicely in one column and centered. What I think I actually need to do is add some alignment to the flex parent. So usually to control horizontal stuff, that's justify content, but because it's vertical, align items should control the width of the children. So let's say align items and let's just say center just to see what happens. Okay, so there we go. So now we have centered them all, and then it only makes the flex children take up the actual width of the content itself. So let's add that in our style. So align items center. Align items center. This looks pretty good. I think we also want to add some space between the text links themselves. Yeah. Let's just say 20. So there's usually a tiny bit of space from just like line height. But I wonder if I could just use line height to make that space. Let's let's experiment again. Line height 1.5. Oh, so if I do two, it actually looks pretty good. Increasing the line height makes it take up a little bit more space, which results in there being space between the links. So then I don't have to do I don't have to add a margin to add space between them, which is like sort of nice. So that looks maybe a little bit more. Line height 2.25 for footer links A. And I don't think this is actually necessary anymore since I fixed it with the align item center thing. Yeah, that seems good. Okay, so I think that this is basically the basic um, mobile styles. Let's move on to the desktop styles. And in desktop, the most important thing we need to figure out right now is what the grid template for CSS grid is going to be. So I think initially I'd said we're going to make this a four column layout. So the first column would be logo plus social. Then we'd have two columns of text links. And then the last column would be the CTA button and the copyright. Now I think that I'm going to also make it two rows because I want the logo to be on one row and the social media icons to be on the second row. So that means the entire template is going to be two rows and four columns. And I think the easiest way to demonstrate that is just to use Adobe XD and to sort of draw squares around each of the cells. So it's a little bit easier um, for you, but also for me to see what the template's gonna be. And then I can write the code in the SCSS file. So let's start with that now. So we got two rows for this first column, and then we'll just have the same, you know, going all the way down. So that's the first column for text links and the second column for text links. And, you know, this isn't super exact right now. So there, there is going to be spaces between the cells, but for just for illustrative purposes, it's not going to be, you know, exactly correct. So it's going to be something like this where we have four columns and two rows. So this means that using the grid template areas, this top one would be called logo and then this one would probably be called social. This one I'll just call links one and then links two. And then the last one will just be CTA. And we'll use those, those names to assign the locations in the template to each of these um, content blocks. 
All right, so in our code editor, we need to figure out where we want to write the code for the footer layout. For CSS grid, kind of like Flexbox, you have a parent element and then you have the child grid elements. So the parent element in this case is going to be the actual footer tag itself. And then each of these areas are going to be the child elements in the grid. So the first one would be logo, second one would be social, then the links one, then links two, then the CTA. And these are all direct children of the parent um, footer element. So in our SAS file, we want to add display grid for, I think, probably just desktop and up. So we can do that with a breakpoint, um, our breakpoint mixin. So include breakpoint up, large, and at this point we will add display grid. So again, this means that on mobile and tablet, it's not going to have the grid layout, it's going to have that stacked one column layout. And we'll, we'll do the same thing for the other properties as we add them. So display grid and then grid template columns. And we wanted four columns, right? So let's take a look at what we want the widths to be for those columns. So it seems like these first three columns are probably roughly around the same width. And then the last column is going to be wider. I'd say maybe, you know, we can say these first three columns would be one FR or FR meaning fractional unit. and then the last one would probably be maybe 2FR, maybe 3FR. Uh, I'm not really sure yet. And that will make the, that will make this last column either twice or three times the width of the first columns. So we'll just do 1FR, 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 and then 2FR for the last one. And we can use the repeat function. So the first three columns are 1FR each. So we can just say repeat 3 comma 1FR for the first three columns, and then the last column will be 2FR. Then we want to add two rows, so I'll say grid template rows, and we want two rows probably the same height for each, so again we'll use repeat 2 comma 1FR, which means the space, each row will be given the same amount of space. Okay, now the last thing is the grid template areas. So this is a little bit um, tricky. It just has a bit different syntax, and I know that when I sort of started using grid template areas, it was a little bit confusing. But basically, going back to our design, you write out the names of each of the areas sort of in the place where you want that block to be in, in the grid. So this one's gonna be called logo. It's gonna be going across in the first row from column left to the right. It'll be logo, links one, links to, and then CTA. And then the second row is going to be social, links one, links to, CTA. So using the same name for two different cells, it tells the browser that that area is going to take up two cells. So the first one's going to be logo. So how this works is we just type in logo, and it is in a string as you can see here. Then the second column is links one, then links two, and the last one will be CTA. So this is kind of the representation of the first row with each name taking up one column. Now we have two rows in our template, so we're gonna add a second one in a string again, and instead of logo, the social media icons will be the first column, then links one, links two, and then CTA again. So this is our grid template. Now you also need to, in addition to creating this in the elements themselves, and I guess I should put this in a breakpoint as well, so include breakpoint up, large, we tell it that the grid area name of this element is logo. And this is part of the slightly confusing thing, but this does not need to be in a string. One, one place that I look to a lot when I'm confused about grid or Flexbox stuff is CSS tricks. So a complete guide to grid, and they also have one for Flexbox. So we're looking for grid areas. This is kind of telling you how the grid template areas work. So you can see they have things in quotes then the actual element, you just have the name and not in quotes. Again, this grid area property of logo will tell the browser that the, lo the footer logo element subscribes to the logo grid template area. So we have to do the same thing for each of these. So I'm actually just gonna copy this. And then this is the footer social area, and that's gonna be called social. And then for the links one, we'll put it in the column one, and then we'll do the same thing for column two which will be links to. 
Then the last area will be the CTA, and that's going to be the entire footer CTA element, which contains the button as well as the copyright info. So that's going to be, I think I just said CTA. These grid area properties, they'll sort of match to what's in the grid template areas. All right, so this looks pretty good. Obviously, it's not completely accurate at the moment, but this is a really good start. Well, let's turn on in the layout tab the grid inspector. So I want the footer to be highlighted. This is a super helpful tool if you are working with Flexbox or Grid. Firefox has these special Flexbox and Grid inspectors, and it just tells you a visual representation of what you have. We actually have not only the lines to designate the rows and columns, but it's also telling you the names of the grid areas that we just created. It says logo, social, links one, links one, links two, links two, and then CTA. And it also tells us that with this dotted line, it's sort of telling you that the area is taking up those two cells, whereas for the logo and social, there's a solid line between them, indicating that they are separate. I think that, let me just uncheck the display area names so we can see a little bit better. But we need to kind of align these correctly, right? So let's work on the horizontal alignment first. And I think we want the logo and the social icons to be aligned to the left. You can control alignment in two different ways. One is sort of global alignment when you set properties on the grid parent. You can also set properties in each grid child to just control the alignment of that cell. So there's a lot of control that you have using CSS grid. And let's kind of figure out what we want to do here. If look at the design, we do want the logo and social icons to be left aligned. And we also want the text links to be left aligned as well. And then the CTA and the copyright are right aligned. So everything's kind of like flush to the edge. So I think we could try using justify content space between. Is that doing anything? It doesn't look like it's doing anything. This might be a flex box thing. Let's go back into our handy CSS tricks guide. Let's justify items. Aligns grid items along the inline row as opposed to align items, which aligns along the block. So let's try justify items start. So justify items start. Oh, there we go. I think what I was doing was justify content, which I use a lot in Flexbox, but I think that just controls the child items as a whole. Justify content. Yeah, so it's the, the total size of your grid. So that seems okay. Um, I also want to, I think, maybe set text align left for desktop because it was centered due to the mobile styles. Um, and then we can fix these as we go along. Now, why are these not, why are these centered? Line item center. I have, a, I have a few different things going on here. So I have the footer links. It's a flex box parent. Let's turn off the grid, look at the flex box. I had done align item center and I actually want to align items, I believe start. Yeah, start. Cause this, in this flex box parent, it's going vertically. So align items will do the cross axis um, arrangement. So I just need to remember to set footer links, align item start for desktop and up. So footer links. And then for breakpoint up large, we're adding a line item start. And then I'll make sure that the links themselves are aligned to the left. And the other thing we wanted to do was for the grid template, justify items start. Let's go back to the grid inspector. So now we can see that the text links are aligned to the left. The logo and social are aligned to the left as well. And then for the CTA, we want to align that to the right. I think we can say um, justify items end. Oh, this is not a grid thing, so I can't do that. I guess I could try text align right. No, that's not right. Oh, it's because I did justify items to the left. So I think for, because this is an individual, this is the grid child item. I can't do justify items. I have to do justify self because that applies to the individual child itself. So I think if I do end, there we go. So if I do text align right and justify self end for the footer CTA desktop styles. So under the breakpoint area, 
Okay, so it looks pretty good for the horizontal stuff, right? Let's just double check and compare that with the design. So yeah, we got the logo and I social media icons on the left. These are aligned left. This is aligned to the right. And that does seem like what we have. So now we need to figure out the vertical alignment. You know, it looks like things are a little bit all over the place. So if we go back to the design, let's just draw a box around the entire footer area just to see how things kind of line up with each other. Looks like things are kind of extending out to the top and the bottom. They're like pretty much almost flush. So if we go back to the footer parent itself, I think what controls the vertical alignment is align. Justify content and align content just control the grid in like the greater parent. So if I want to control the alignment inside the grid, I have to use items. So align items. Okay, aligns grid items along the block axis. So the values can be start and center and stretch. So I think I want stretch so it goes all the way to the top and the bottom. So we'll try that. It didn't seem to do anything. Something else is adding this extra space. I wonder, I might have some margins actually. So let's look at the links. Oh, there is a margin in the social. So let's just cancel that out. So margin bottom zero. And then I guess logo also. There's a margin there. Okay, I might just need to go back and move all the margins that I added for mobile into a breakpoint down media query because I only want it to take effect on mobile and tablet. So let's see where, the, here we go, margin bottom. So include breakpoint down. So I want this to apply to tablet and down. Oh, medium, I mean medium and down. And then we'll add the margin bottom there. Let me just copy this media query. So same thing here. Margin bottom here. And I think there was one, yeah, for the button. Okay. Now that we've removed the margins from desktop, let's see how the site looks. Did that help at all? See, the social icons are still like really, they're too high. I want them to be flush to the bottom. What happens if I do an align self for footer social? Get rid of the height thing. Turn on align self to the end. Does that seem right? It seems a bit tall. In any case, we want them to be on the top and bottom anyway. So let me add align self to footer social for desktop. Okay, the text links themselves look okay. Now I need to do this, the aligning for the CTA section. So in the CTA section, we have this, and then we have a copyright. So I think if I do align self, is stretch an option for this? Oh, it is. Stretch, not working. This is kind of annoying. Okay. I'm just kind of curious. Start, have it end. I think I may need to separate these out into different cells so I can sort of align them the same way I did with the logo and the social. So footer CTA, I'll only have it have the button. And I'll delete that extra div and then do that. So then footer CTA is in its own thing. Footer copyrights is, is, is in its own thing as well. So let's go back and first I'll have to add a grid area for the copyright since that's a new thing. So include breakpoint up large grid area and I'll call it copyright. Then I'll need to add the copyright name to the grid template. So before we had the CT and copyright in one thing, now we're going to have CT on top and then copyright on the bottom. Okay, much better. Um, so now we can sort of try to, we'll add another rule for align self end, and then justify self end. Okay. Okay, that looks pretty good. I do feel like things are a little bit taller than they should be. You know, I wonder if the font size should be smaller for the for the text links. You see that? This should be 15 or so pixels. How big is the font size right now? It is, if we go to computed, font size is 18. 
And where did that rule come from? It's just from the body font size. Okay, so for the footer links, I need to set a font size of 15 pixels. So that, that should help with making the content less tall. And I'm guessing it's going to be the same font size for mobile as well. So font size, 15 pixels divided by 16 is 0.9375 rems. All right, let's give that a shot. Okay, looks shorter, which is great. Maybe the easy bank text itself needs to be a bit smaller too. It's probably about the same 15 pixels. So we'll copy this property and add it to the copyright as well. Okay. Maybe there's just too much space. Because I had initially added all that space using line height. So if I reduce line height, it's still a bit tall. Interesting. Let's just say line height one just to make it really short. Oh, you know what it is? It's because I set the row. I set the rows to be one FR, which means the top row and the bottom row have to be the same height because that's how I set it. But obviously the bottom row, the social media icons and the copyright doesn't need to be the same height as the top row. And the top row looks like it's getting its height because of the button. Um, which is making everything be too tall. Let's fix this row problem first, and then we'll figure out if we need to decrease the line height for these. So instead of 1FR, I think the second row should be something less. Where is it? Here, grid template rows. So the first top row should be 1FR. If I do auto, it'll just... Oh, if I do auto, it just sort of does that. Let's, let's try that. So in the parent, we'll change grid template rows to 1FR and auto. Here we go. So instead of this repeat thing for the rows, we'll just do 1FR and auto. Okay, so this is shorter. Now the line height is kind of what's limiting it. So let's, let's try one. Okay, see now it got really short, which is great. Maybe 1.5. You know, maybe I don't want to use line height because that's kind of like making it a static distance. What if instead, in the footer link, since I know that is a flexbox parent, I could say justify content space between, and that will sort of auto stretch to fit that. So I think that's a much better way of doing that, at least for desktop. We want the line height for mobile because we're not using grid for that. So footer links for desktop. Here we go. I think I personally just do justify stuff before the align properties. Okay, so this looks closer, which is great. Now I, I'm guessing that this button might be a little bit tall. I am kind of curious where this height is coming from now. Oh, I still I forgot to take out the line height. Okay, <laughs> that's my problem. So maybe I'll just remove line height for the footer links A for desktop. So I just want to use this on tablet and mobile. So I'll use my breakpoint down. And I know that I usually use the breakpoint up, meaning I use min width media queries, but I think in this case, because we're adding styles for mobile, I would prefer to use the breakpoint down um, using max width media queries. Otherwise, I would have to cancel out all the margins and line heights for desktop. That looks a lot better. So I think maybe this button is now what's kind of making it a bit tall. Okay, how big is this button? Oops. It is 46 pixels tall or so. And how big is it on the website? Okay, so it is 46. You know, I'm not gonna split hairs here. I think this looks pretty okay. So even though it's taller than it is on the design, I think it's okay. And I just kind of added some space here so I'm not blocking it with the picture of myself for you all. It's kind of weird, it even looks like there's more space in the design. I think the logo and the social media icons actually might be a little bit too tall. So let's just tweak that and then we'll sort of consider this um, complete. The logo should be 23 pixels tall and about the same for the social icons. So let's see what we got. Mm, 20. And the icons look like they're 25. Okay, so yeah, they are a little bit big. Image itself says 20, which is good. And then for some reason, the thing is 25, the anchor link. Maybe I just need to set a height. 
If I set a height of 20 pixels, will that help? Oh yeah, it does. Okay, we'll just say height 20 pixels for the footer social A. Social A, here we go. And I'm assuming the same height will be for mobile as well, so we don't need to use a media query for that. So 20 divided by 16 is 1.25 rems. That seems all right. Okay, now that I look at this again, I think that there's a couple things I need to do. The first one is I need to limit the footer content so it doesn't go all the way across. I think I forgot to add the container class. So let's do that first. And then we might need to tweak some of the alignment. Okay, so in footer, I'm gonna have to add a container class. Container. And I don't remember if I wanna add the padding helper classes, but let's just move these into the footer. Container. And because originally the footer tag itself was a grid parent, I'm going to have to move all the grid properties into the footer container. So footer, and then we'll just put it here at the top container. So we'll move all the grid stuff into the container element. Okay, hopefully that'll work. Let's, let's take a look. Okay, much better. So now we can see it's not going all the way to the left and the right. Things just seem cramped, even though the height's like so tall. Is that button really the right height? Yeah, it's 46. And you make the copyright text smaller, I think. Right now it is 15. I'm gonna make it, I think 13. It needs to be a lot smaller. 13 divided by 16, 0.1825. Okay. 8125, not 18. There we go. Okay, I think the color was darker too, right? Well, it's not white, it's kind of a light gray. What color would that be? Maybe grayish blue? So, you know, this is just kind of tweaking, trying to double check the design and the site and just make sure everything looks correct. Yeah, there's more space between the button and the copyright. Something is not right. I wonder, is it including the padding that I added? No, this is 70. Oh, okay, so it's 76. Okay, so it is adding the padding. So it's actually now it's too short, which is the same as like what I was thinking it was. So let's increase that line height again to um, make it taller. Line height 1.5. Oh, wait. Wrong selector. Forgot a second underscore. There we go. Maybe 1.75, 2.25. 2 2.25 line height is giving us the correct height of about 100. Okay, glad we figured that out. So footer links A. I knew something was off. I just took me a while to figure out where it actually was. There we go, footer links A. Oh wait, 2.5. Is that the same? Oh my gosh, it's the same freaking line height. So let me just remove this media query. There we go. Okay, this looks much closer to the design. <laughs> okay, so now we've gotten the height right. I think we need to tweak this like horizontal spacing. Um, there's, it's too close here and there's too much space, I think. So yeah, so it seems like there's more space between EasyBank, the logo, and then the first text link. Let's see, how do I want to do that? I guess I could maybe increase the width of the first column. So if we go into the grid parent, um, instead of making all the columns the same, I could just try to tweak these a little bit. So I'll probably leave the text links as one FR. And so I'm just gonna try this out in the browser. But what if I said two FR, one FR, one FR, and then three FR, maybe two FR, oh, maybe three. Okay, let's see how close that is to the design. Hey, that's not bad. Um, there's a few things that look like they're off. So there's just a tiny bit more space between these. I think I also forgot to add a grid gap property, so let's try that. 
gap of maybe one rim? Two rims? Let's try one rim. So that, that gap property, let me just show you how that looks. So it's adding space of one rem or 16 pixels between all the cells in the template. So I think that's probably good to keep. So I need to add gap of one rem and then I need to change the template itself. It'll be 2FR, 1FR, 1FR, 3FR. Okay, so grid template columns. Place this. I know I could use repeat to 1FR, but I mean, it's kind of the same at this point if you're only repeating, if you're only repeating it once. And then what else did I wanted to add? Oh yeah, the gap of one. I'll add the gap under areas, I guess. One rim. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's compare with the design again. That looks fairly close. And I'm actually okay with like, I have a little more space between the social icons, but I think that's okay. All right, now moment of truth, let's see how this looks on mobile. Does it decrease? Once it hits that breakpoint for tablet, it goes to one column and it is centered and stacked. And then for mobile, I'll just turn on the emulator thing. That looks pretty good. So I think we have the basic styles down. Now let's get to some sort of, let's kind of polish it up a little bit. There's a few things I usually try to add. Main thing is hover states, because these are all links and you want the style to change slightly when you hover over them so you know what's going on. So for the socials, let's check the design. Oh, here we go. So we did some, if we hover, it turns green on the social icons as well as the text links. And then the request invite has the same thing where it like goes to white. So let's do those. The social icons, that would be social icons, the images, um, they're SVGs and we want to change them from the white to the green color. Now, since I loaded these SVGs as image tags, I might actually change that because what I want to do is change the fill in the SVG itself. Let me show you what that looks like. So icon Facebook, if we look at that. So it tells you the fill is FFF, which is white. Um, and there is actually a way that you can alter that in CSS, but only if you're loading the SVG as an SVG tag and not the image tag. So I'm gonna have to change this. So I'm gonna copy this. So we're actually just using inline SVGs at this point. And then I think, can I just move the alt? No. Huh, there's no alt for that, that's interesting. I'm just curious about this uh, alt tag for SVGs. Accessible. It's purely decorative, it doesn't need alternate text. I think we do because they're like social icons. Inside the SVG add title. Oh, must be the first child of its parent element. Oh, it'll be used as a tooltip. That's helpful. Okay, so let's do that. So say, the first child um, here, so path is the first child originally, but now we're adding titles and we'll add Facebook. That's pretty good. And we'll have to do the same thing for the other ones. So YouTube, copy that, place the image and then add the title, YouTube. So now, let's load it up. Everything's the same. Let's just double check. Yeah, so it is actually loading the SVGs, which is good. If we hover, it tells us the uh, title, which is great. So now to adjust the color, to adjust the hover, we want to, in the SVG, alter the path fill. And we can do that in CSS, which is pretty awesome. So if we go down to social, a, so in the A tag, it's gonna be SVG path. That's going to be the element. Social A, hover. And I could nest it under the A element, but okay, maybe I'll do that. Under the A, hover. 
SVG element and then the path element is going to have fill of the green color, lime green. And then we also want to add its transition so it's a little bit more nice looking. Hopefully this works. Fill and then how fast we want to be, maybe 150 milliseconds. Ease in out. Oh, hey. Very nice. Cool. So we we're able to add the transition and the hover fill color for these social icons. We want to do the same thing for these text um, links as well. So that's going to be in the footer links A. So footer links A hover color Oop. lime green, I think it was. And then, of course, we're doing the same thing. So transition color 150 milliseconds ease in out. Oops. Okay. There we go. Nice. And the last thing we want to do is this button hover state. And you can see it's losing opacity when you hover over it. And that's because when I first coded this button, it was just on a white background. So I could simply reduce the opacity and make it sort of look like there's a white overlay. Obviously it doesn't work with a dark background, so I'm going to have to build a semi-transparent white overlay over this, over the linear gradient color. So I think I can do that with a pseudo element. So let's just sort of try. So in our global SAS file, going down to the button styles. So right now the opacity thing I'm I'm just going to comment that out because it's not really working for us. And I'm going to have to add a pseudo element. So let's just try the before. And content is blank, so it shows up. Um, you have to have a content property set for your before and after elements. Then I'll say background color. We should just do background since it's using a linear gradient. Um, I think background is actually, linear gradients actually apply to the image, if I'm not mistaken, background image. Oh, let me just see if that's correct really quick. Yeah, so yeah, background image. And unfortunately background image does not transition nicely, so we'll, we might have some issues when we do this, but okay, going back here. So we're making an overlay. Um, I'm going to have to position this absolutely, I think, because we want it to be on top of the rest of the button. Right, zero. And this is just to make it go to, you know, all the different edges. And because it's positioned absolute, I just need to make sure the parent is position relative, which it is. Um, that's good. And I'll make sure the position absolute child will sort of remain inside the parent, which is relative. Then background um, color, and because we want to be RG, we want it to be RGBA, so it will be semi-transparent. So white is 255, 255, 255, and transparency. Let's just say 0 0.25. We don't want to go full white, otherwise you won't be able to read the text. Okay, now let's just see. Let's see how that looks. And I'm not, it's not attached to a hover state right now. I just kind of built it to sort of test and see how it'll look. Ooh, that looks, that looks pretty close to what we had before, actually. Um, so set so opacity. So opacity zero, it won't show up. And then it'll show up when we add, uh, when we get rid of the opacity zero. So I'm going to use that for the hover state. So this actually was a pretty easy solution. I thought it was going to be a bit harder than that. Um, so by default, we'll set this opacity to zero. And then on the hover state, we'll set opacity to one. So we want to transition that so it's nice and smooth. We'll use 150 milliseconds like the other hover state speeds. And then on hover, um, hover on the parent, we're going to make the before element opacity 1. 
Hey, not bad. Not too shabby. Okay, so I think we got our other estates pretty good. Let's just double check and make sure the top one works too. Oh yeah, nice. Sweet. So let's just check one more time, see how this looks on tablet and mobile. Good. Let's just use the emulator so it's easier to see. So here's mobile. Looks pretty good. And then iPad. I think that's okay on tablet. If you wanted to, you could also make this like maybe two columns on tablet, but I'm just going to stick with the one column because I think that's fine. And it's at the bottom anyway, so it's not like it's blocking. It's not like people have to scroll past it. Cool, so I think we can actually consider this whole web page complete. And that's it for building this landing page template. If you made it all the way through, congratulations! And let us know down in the comments what you thought of this video. And as always, thanks for watching and keep on coding!